me make sure this works. Oh, cool. Then we're recording. Okay, does this look okay? Full screen? Yep. All right, cool. I see some yep. nods and all right, nice. I can put the chat on the other monitor here so I can see. So if you wanna ask questions in chat, I'll try to monitor it. But like I said, uh, as we go through this, just feel free to unmute and have conversations. There's no, no need for this to be like a conference talk or a lecture where we just save questions to the end. All right, I kind of gave already gave a little bit of a, a rough outline of how I wanted today to go, but more technically or more in depth here, the the rough agenda is I'll give you more of a brief intro on me and my background, and then we're going to start with just talking about high level cybersecurity concepts. Um, I really like whenever I'm teaching security or teaching any topic really is to make sure we have a strong foundation and we understand like high level concepts and underlying technologies and foundational knowledge, because then we build up from there. So we're going to start talking just about high level security concepts, and then we're going to go all the way back to the basics and talk about just like what is a web app and what is HTTP. Um, for some of you, uh, or most of you, if you're already learning like Django and React, a lot of this might be like um, remedial education like or, or things that seem already basic but i really like to make sure we're all on the same page because we have to understand those building blocks of what what creates a web app so before we can really talk about why web apps become vulnerable and then we're going to do some deep dives into three classes of web vulnerabilities uh someone already mentioned sql injection that's going to be the third one we talk about but the other two are going to be cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery you may or may not have heard of these but these are three really common and pervasive types of vulnerabilities that we discover in web applications um, all the time. And it's important to understand like how they work, why they work, how bad they are. And then of course, we'll talk about techniques and strategies to address them. Uh, after that, we'll probably take a break for lunch if we get through everything. And then afterwards, we'll get more into the hands-on portion and we'll walk through setting up a tool called Burp Suite. And I'll, I'll share before lunch, like a link, you can download it. Um, but we're going to be using Burp Suite Community Edition, which is just a free uh, online or a free tool that does web security testing, um, or it can be used for web security testing. It doesn't like do it automatically. And, and then we'll walk through. I'll make sure everyone gets that set up on their laptops. If you want to follow along, which I encourage you to. Um, but by the way, if you don't want to actually do hands-on or follow along, I'll screen share and you can just follow along with me. Um, and then we'll do a bit of a hands-on lab together. And then the last like hour and a half or so, depending on time, we'll actually launch the CTF. All right, so a little bit more intro about me uh, and who I am and why I'm here talking to you. My name is Ronnie Flathers. Uh, I guess I should update this slide because like I said earlier, technically I moved. I'm in the suburbs of Chicago now. I used to be right downtown, but now I'm in a, a, a suburb called Northbrook. Uh, but I've spent my entire career basically in one fashion or another in cybersecurity. Uh, I've done NetSec, AppSec, ProdSec, DevSecOps, all these all these acronyms that but they all have the, the, the acronym SEC in there for security. Uh, I am currently a principal engineer for product security at a company called Marketa, which is based in Oakland, but I work fully remote out here. Uh, but previously, I actually started my career and spent most of my um, well, the first part of it, uh, of my career anyway, on the consulting, pen testing, and red team side. So I, I came up and I have a very strong offensive background. Uh, I joined and worked with a company called Neohapsis, which was eventually acquired by Cisco. And my, my normal day-to-day -day job there was essentially being paid by companies to come in and try to break in, uh, break into their web apps, break into their networks, break into their systems, and then write reports <laughs> and show them how we did it and then give them advice on how to fix it. So being a consultant and a red teamer and a pen tester, I had to learn and got exposed to a lot of different technologies, but always had to kind of put on this like evil black hat hacker mentality and figure out how to break things. After doing that for several years, I switched gears a little bit um, and went more in like the defensive engineering uh, uh, side of the house. 
So I had taken a lot of those skills that I picked up and learned being an offensive security person, but then joined companies like Uptake and Motorola to help them build out their internal security capabilities with application security um, and security engineering. And currently that's what I do at Marketa. Our product security team here at Marketa uh, is responsible for ensuring that all of the applications and the code that our developers and our engineers create is secure. And we do that through a lot of different means. We do that through training and partnerships. We do it through automating tools. We do it through detection, writing our own custom scanners and looking for them and response. If we identify a vulnerability or someone else identifies a vulnerability, um, me and my team are super heavily involved in like fixing the code or fixing the architecture to make sure that we, we eliminate that vulnerability. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm not as active as I once was, but I, I post occasionally. Um, Ropnop, I also have uh, a, a GitHub with some public um, repos, including one of the challenges you can find up there. And then I blog occasionally as well, but blog ropnop.com. All right, now a little intro on OWASP. Uh, should have mentioned this before um, or asked before, but I'll ask now, like, is anyone familiar with OWASP? Have you heard of OWASP before? Yeah, they, they maintain a uh, the top 10, which includes, I guess, the three things you mentioned, uh, like the really common vulnerabilities. And then they also make a tool that's, I think, similar to Burp Suite. Um, that I, I used a little bit. 100% right. Uh, so I am a member of the, I'm a member of OWASP, uh, specifically like the Chicago chapter, which is how I actually got connected with Code Platoon in the first place. And so I'm, I'm, I'm here on behalf of OWASP. We're trying to represent OWASP to you as, as well. And OWASP is just an awesome organization. Uh, it stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. And it's just a nonprofit foundation with, uh, I mean, there's a centralized board, but really there's uh, chapters in major cities and metropolitan areas all around the world. And OWASP members really just dedicate their time to give out free resources, free tools, free trainings uh, with the lofty goal of just making the web more secure. Um, and, and so a lot of OWASP flagship projects are used everywhere and used in enterprises. You'll, you'll see it come up. And, and some of those big projects I've linked here. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but the, the gentleman who was just speaking mentioned like OWASP top 10. Um, the OWASP top 10 is a curated list that OWASP releases every four years that is the top 10 most critical web application vulnerabilities or risks. And, and it's really an industry benchmark. Like you'll see the OWASP top 10 used everywhere um, from large enterprises to small startups to just open source projects. It's really an awesome reference to be like, what is the current state of web app security? Like what vulns do I need to worry about? Uh, what do I need to be looking for? And how can I like train my developers or learn more about them to fix it? Some other projects that OWASP puts out is the Application Security Verification Standard, which is a essentially a checklist if you're developing a new web application. It's like, here's a checklist of all the security things you should be thinking about and what you should be implementing. The SAM project is the Software Assurance Maturity Model, um, which is also a bit of a checklist, but instead of being technical, it's more for like an organization. If you're ever working in a company that's trying to build out a security program, this is a great framework to be like, oh, here's like the types of like roles and policies and procedures we should have. And then the last one, Zap, is the tool uh, that you mentioned, which is very similar to Burp Suite. So Zap is the Z attack proxy. It's a open source uh, intercepting proxy. And we'll talk about the concept of intercept proxy here. But it's a tool that can be used to identify web vulnerabilities, either manually or automated. OWASP also sponsors some conferences. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they've happened in a while because of COVID, but there usually is once a year a global uh, conference and then more regional conferences as well that are awesome networking events and great places to like learn and, and follow those, those talks. And then there is a Chicago chapter, and I don't think that they've met in person now for a while, but hopefully soon. Uh, I'd love to get back involved. If anyone's in the Chicagoland area, there is a Chicago OWASP chapter. Ronnie, I may ask you a question um, from not the last slide, but the one before that. And this is going to sound really basic, but um, you mentioned Red Hat and Black Hat. And I have heard the term, and I, I should probably know what these mean. I know that Black Hat means like somebody who is like 
actively trying to attack and do nefarious things. Mm -hmm. I thought like white hat was uh, the thing you were talking that you were doing it like Neo Hapsis, but maybe I've got the hats colors mixed up and um, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Thank you for, for calling me on that. The terminology is a little bit fuzzy and, and confusing, but yeah, um, I, I think historically, right, black hat and white hat are terms that came from cowboy movies where the bad guy in a cowboy movie always wears a black hat and the good guy in a cowboy movie always wears a white hat. So they, they colloquially just kind of became terms where a black hat is a bad guy and a white hat is a good guy. So um, when it's applied to like penetration testing or hacking, generally when we say a, a black hat, we mean like a criminal, like someone who's actually doing this type of hacking for criminal purposes without permission, they're bad guys. And, and that's what we're concerned about when we're trying to, you know, defend an organization is we're, we're trying to defend against the black hats. Uh, white hats is, you're right, I should have said white hat, is more like what I did when I was at Neohapsis and Cisco. They are white hat hackers, um, meaning they're given full permission. We know that they're doing it. They're good guys. They're working for the right reasons. And, but they're still emulating the exact same things that a black hat would do. So I was a white hat hacker. That's what I got, you know, paid to do. That's what we did at Neohapsis and Cisco. Um, but in, in the reason I, I said black hat is because even as, as a white hat hacker, you have to be aware of what the black hats are doing and you have to basically follow them and emulate them. So there's a lot of like innovation that happens in the black hat world by, by criminals and, um, and nation state hackers and the white hats do it. So we kind of say sometimes like, oh, I put my black hat on I mean, I'm thinking like a black hat attacker. I'm not actually like doing a crime or doing anything illegal. Cool. Does that Thank answer you. your question? Yep. It does. And you had mentioned red hat. So is red hat just like another white hat activity? And I don't want to belabor this, but I'm just curious because I'm not familiar with the term so much. Um, no, I, I, if I mentioned red hat, I probably misspoke. Uh, when I, red hat's just a company. Um, uh, so if I, if I, Miss, if I said Red Hat, I think I misspoke. Uh, as far as I know, I'm, Red Hat's not really a term I've used in, or heard in the security context before. I probably misheard. I'm sorry, but thanks, no Ronnie. Problem. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, I think what I did say is Red Team, um, and, and I, I can clarify that for everyone who was a little uh, or, or wasn't quite sure. In kind of the same vein as Black Hat and White Hat, like security loves our, our analogies here. Um, you'll also hear the terms Red Team and Blue Team and sometimes Purple Team. So a red team is, you can think of as like the, the offensive side of security. Uh, these terms, I think, came from military when there was like war games where like the red team was on the offense, like the attackers and the blue team had to hold a position and defend. So in the concept of an organization or consulting, if you hire a red teamer or you bring in a red team, they're the ones that are going to actively be trying to like probe and find vulnerabilities and exploit the systems where the blue team will be within the company and trying to detect them and, de and defend against that and protect them. So you have the red team, blue team dynamic going on all the time within companies. And, and then sometimes they will merge together and do a joint project and that's called a purple team. So I, I may use those terms throughout the conversation. So I'm happy to, uh, uh, I'm happy to uh, explain that now and please call me out if I use terms like that that aren't immediately clear. Um, sometimes they're not even immediately clear to me. I've just used them for so long that I'm like, oh yeah, that's a purple team without thinking about what that really actually means. Thanks a ton. I appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. Red Hat are the ones that like to make frustrating operating systems and then charge an arm and a leg for support contracts. Absolutely. All right. So that, that's the brief introduction of me and brief introduction introduction of OWASP. Uh, so now I'll dive into just high level application security concepts. I like to start with this tweet by uh, a gentleman named Jim Manico. He is an ex-board member of OWASP, but still heavily uh, involved in OWASP. He's like also a world renowned like application security trainer. My company's used him to come in and like teach developers security. And I, I just love this tweet when I screenshotted it. Uh, it says, from my experience, all software developers are now security engineers, whether they know it, admit to it, or do it. Your code is now the security of the org you work for. 
hashtag golden age of defense. And I wanted to stress this because I really think this is true and the tides are totally turning when it comes to application security and cybersecurity. The, the traditional role of a cybersecurity engineer or a cybersecurity organization is, is really actually just kind of falling apart and blending in with more software engineering. Um, as we've moved towards this DevOps model and this concept of like total ownership of code, like you as a software engineer own your code from keyboard to production, the entire like deployment pipeline. You also own the security of your code. And as Jim says, whether you know it, admit to it, do it, or even want it. Um, but that's kind of the, the situation that we're in now. And that's actually a great situation to be in. Like I love working in that type of environment where security isn't just an afterthought or a separate part of my company that occasionally yells at me if I do something wrong. Like security is just part of software engineering now in much the same way that you know quality is part of software engineering. Like user experience is part of software engineering. These are all things as you are developing code and developing web applications that you must be aware of. This is also why I love giving this class and I was just like super happy back when I was approached to even ask teach this is because having a having a, a boot camp or a class on doing web application development in my opinion can't really be complete unless it also talks about security like all of this stuff is super important and all of you are in a great position right now like very primed to go out if you want after this to look for software engineering jobs to look for development jobs and knowing that you have some security background um, and knowing at least the high level concepts and some of the material that we're going to go through and i encourage you uh, uh, to continue that journey and continue learning about security because it really is a differentiator. It's really a value add for any software engineer or web developer if they can speak security, if they know security. Um, it's, it's really gonna be an extremely valuable skill that's just gonna get more and more valuable in the future. So now I'm gonna talk about security terms. I kind of already have talked about red hat or uh, no, black hat, red hat, red team, purple team. Like sometimes I remember when I hear myself speak that there's like a whole nother like dictionary language when it comes to security. And I'll drop into it like I'm fluent in it. But um, some of these terms can be a little bit foreign. But it is really important that I, and I want to uh, stop on this slide to actually talk about some like important terms and what they mean. And I think the reason it's important to have this like understanding like shared language or, or lexicon of, of terminology is we can use, this is how we communicate both up and down. In my job as a security engineer, I talk both up, meaning to like C level like executives, and down, meaning to like individual software developers. And if we have these kind of these, these shared terms, we can talk about vulnerabilities in either technical fashion or like business fashion, but use the same type of terms. So on the left is a, a, an important concept that comes up all the time in security. And it's called the CIA triad. And CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And a lot of times when we are discussing the security of a system or designing a system, we're gonna frame that discussion within the CIA triad. And what, what it means is confidentiality, uh, the confidentiality of a system means that you have to expect privacy. If I'm using the system, my data needs to be confidential. Integrity really means that I can trust my data. That if I'm like sending data to a system, it, it's not gonna be tampered with. Uh, and when I read the data back, I trust that the data has not been modified. And then availability, means I can actually talk to the system. If I try to talk to it, uh, it's up and it's, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna get an error message. Uh, I think if you all remember or saw like two days ago, was it like AWS, US East One's region went out and there was like no availability for a lot of stuff. Um, that's what availability means in this. The reason it's a triad or a triangle is it's impossible to have perfect confidentiality, perfect integrity and perfect availability. Like everything is always a compromise. You kind of have to be like, okay, I could either make the world's most available system, but I'm gonna end up sacrificing confidentiality or we need to focus entirely on confidentiality, but maybe we'll sacrifice integrity. And it's very dependent on what you're building to decide like which of these is more important. It's all a balancing act and we have limited resources. Uh, so at where I'm at now, 
Um, Marketa is like a, a finance tech company. Uh, we do a lot of credit card processing. Confidentiality is extremely important to us. And that kind of drives a lot of our decisions, right? We need to make sure like credit card numbers and account numbers and social security numbers are confidential. Integrity, also very important. Uh, financial like ledgers, making sure we can track every single dollar. Availability, I'm not saying it's not important, but in the grand scheme of things, like if you swipe your credit card and it, it declines or it takes like three seconds instead of two seconds, it's not the end of the world, right? Like it's not like the biggest concern for us. Um, I'm really speaking bad. Uh, if someone heard Marquetta, like absolutely availability is a big concern for us, but I'm saying in the context of confidentiality and integrity, like those take precedent in a lot of the security decisions that we make. Now at my last job, I worked at Motorola Solutions. We made radio and communication gear for first responders. If you dialed 911, it was our systems that were routing that call. Availability was the most important thing. It was oftentimes the only important thing that mattered because if you're in an emergency and dial 911 and no one picks up because the system is down, we've really failed our job. So it really is, like I said, context and org dependent. If you're designing a system or an application, think about which of these is the most important to you or recognize that you can't have all three of them and you have to kind of make some decisions around each. <coughs> um, on the right is just a few words and how they relate to each other. Um, I'll be using the words vulnerability, threat, and risk a lot. Um, the, the main thing to take away from this chart is that threat, act, threat actors are people. Threat actors are like the black hats or the nation state attackers. Uh, threats are more high level concepts. Threats always exist. We're surrounded by threats. No matter what we're doing, like a threat is out there and we have to be thinking of the threat. But a threat doesn't necessarily get anywhere unless it also discovers a vulnerability. So when you have a threat and you have a vulnerability that can be exploited, then you have a problem. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. And then lastly, risk is a separate concept from vulnerability or threat. But we think about both of those in the concept of identifying like what is the risk to our system or risk to our application. And the last term that I use a lot, but it can be a little confusing is controls. Controls are really just things that you do to defend yourself or things that are put in place to lower your risk. So controls could be things like, um, strong passwords. Controls could be things like hiring a security guard to stand outside your retail store. Control could be something like providing employee training on phishing. Um, there's all different types of controls, but they're all designed to essentially lower our cybersecurity risk. So I, I touched on this essentially, right? The difference between a threat and a vulnerability. Um, I like to teach this class and the reason I'm going to do hands-on stuff at the end of the day where we're actually like exploiting vulnerabilities is I think it's always really important to put that black hat on or pretend, you know, to be a black hat for, for a while and think like an attacker. But it's also really important to be realistic and to contextualize everything. Um, I will say like I oftentimes, and unfortunately in my, uh, in my experience, I have seen, you know, people, my peers, like cybersecurity engineers, go way overboard with elaborate attacks. Uh, they're thinking like, you know, we're trying to defend our, our system and they're talking about, well, what if Jason Bourne breaks into our data center like Mission Impossible and comes down and like pulls out a hard drive from our server rack. Like you can really drive yourself crazy as you start thinking about like all the ways that we could be attacked, but you really have to take a deep breath and be a little bit realistic. And it's like, I'd, I'd tell them like, okay, what's more realistic? Like we've got like the Mission Impossible guy coming into our data center, like in the middle of the night avoiding lasers, or we accidentally use a default password on a router. Like there's one, one of those is way more likely than the other. And that's what we should probably be focusing on. Um, and to find threats and vulnerabilities, there's different activities you can perform. Uh, threat modeling and vulnerability scanning, which I think I'll talk about on the next slide. But really, the combination of those is when you understand risk. And risk is based in reality. Risk is based on like what is actually possible, not just possible, but probable. Okay, so uh, I want to do a little exercise with you all. Um, this, is, this is always fun to me. I think having physical analogs here uh, in, from the digital world like helps kind of explain these concepts. So let's all put our security hats on and we are designing a bank 
And if it helps, we can think that we're in the Wild West. Like we're, there's actual black hats and white hats. So we're designing a new bank and we're installing a big vault, but we're thinking and worried about the security of our bank. So knowing that threats are just sort of like universal, like things we should be aware of and worried about. If you were building a bank, what sort of threats would you, uh, what, what sort of threats can you think of? Like a threat that could be against a, this bank that we're building in this Wild West town? Robbers with guns. Yep. Absolutely. So, so robbers with guns. Um, that's got, I think robbers with guns, specifically like the people, could be threat actors. And the threat there could be armed robbery. That's, a, that's a, a spot on example. We have one threat, armed robbery, threat actors, bandits with guns. Any other threats we could think of for our bank? You go with like, like a mark. inside corruption, somebody skimming money from the inside. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Great one. Um, absolutely. So if we're, if we're building our bank, like a threat to us could be a malicious insider, someone embezzling money or stealing money out the front door. And the threat actor there, or I guess the threat actor is the malicious insider. The threat is like embezzlement or cooking the books. A fireproof safe or fire, I guess. Fire. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Like there's, there's threats that exist that are like unrelated to humans. Like there's a fire could burn our entire bank down. That's actually a threat to the bank. That's a threat to the, the existence of our bank. So fire is a threat earthquake, tornado, like acts of God, those are threats. Maybe like a market crash? Yeah. Okay. I like that too. So yeah, a threat could just be economic conditions, things that are completely beyond our control, but like the, a massive recession or a depression um, could ruin our, ruin our business and ruin our bank financially. So that's definitely an existential threat to our company. Could emergency situations, like maybe like fire alarms and things when everybody would get out what could that be threat because you know if things aren't done right maybe someone could sneak in and do something yeah i think i think i see where you're going i think uh right at the end there is kind of like where i would focus more on the threat like the threat could be someone leaning over the counter and stealing money in the confusion um and so there there's definitely threats of people grabbing money and running or misusing systems there that can be made more likely in the event of like an, a fire alarm where there's confusion, right? Is that what you were kind of getting at? Yeah, that, that basically like any time a situation where someone's switching out or moving around personnel in any way, you know, some maybe sometime in that confusion, if there's not any like backup or coordination, it could be someone could use that vulnerability to get in there or do something. Yeah, uh, yep. And it, you use the magic word vulnerability because I think that's a, a great example that you're uh, you're jumping ahead to, but that is definitely a vulnerability there. I see someone in, in chat, a few in chat, like bank runs, absolutely. Power loss. Yeah, power loss would be a threat. Um, so we, I think we, we also mentioned a little bit of threat actors. You can take those threats and then think of who the actor would be. You know, it's the bank robber or it's the people doing the bank run or it's uh, the tornado, I guess, would be a threat. <laughs> um, but now I want to talk a little bit about vulnerabilities. So we've identified all these threats and that's great. Like threats exist regardless of our bank existing or not. Like those are just things that are out there, right? They're kind of like in the ether, like, oh, there's a, there's a threat. Uh, there's always a threat of robbery. There's always a threat of fire. There's always a threat of a market crash. But they're only really going to impact our bank if our bank is vulnerable to them. So what are some possible vulnerabilities that we need to think about or we could identify in our bank that would make us very susceptible to these threats? Like how secure the vault is, but at the same time, I guess, wouldn't, could that also end up being control too? Yep. Yeah. So vulnerabilities and controls, you're right, are oftentimes very linked because a vulnerability could also just be a lack of control. Um, but yeah, that's that's the classic example there. Like if we have a super weak vault that can just be like broken with a with a hammer or a, has a default pin code or something on it, like that is a vulnerability. And that vulnerability exposes us to risk because a bank robber coming in could just break down the vault and steal the money. The control in that place would be have a super heavy duty vault with a complex combination. So vulnerabilities and controls are linked. So I guess I'll talk about, or we can, we can talk about both of those together. Um, any other vulnerabilities slash controls that we can think about? Would any time they're transferring money be a problem? Like if there's money, since it's not in the safe, it's not actually technically safe at that point. So would that be a vulnerability time? Uh, 
Yeah, I think I think it could be it'd be a vulnerability if it wasn't safe. So it right if if let's say we do like transfer money, you know, like the the Brinks armored car pulls up to like get the cash uh, out mm-hmm. of the vault, but when the guy goes into the vault, he just like grabs the cash and then just just hangs out or it's like, you know, a loose backpack or he puts it down and starts having a conversation with the teller or something like that. Like those are vulnerabilities. We're really mismanaging the cash in transit there. So I think the vulnerability is like mismanagement of the, of the, 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 the transfer is what you're saying. Yep. Yeah. Um, or money and doors left unlocked in a truck, right? If he doesn't even lock his truck or parks it or gets in an accident, like, yeah, that could be vulnerability. Too many people with keys and combinations. Nice. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, the technical analog to that that I love is like too many people with full admin access to everything, uh, which is basically what we're talking about is, yeah, that is a vulnerability and a lack of control. Um, if you, we need controls for proper, it's called access management. Um, and if every single employee has the key to the vault and you're just co- making copies of keys and then losing them or forgetting about them, that's definitely a vulnerability against our bank. Maybe not having duplicates of financial information. Yeah, nice. Yep, this is this is a great call out because you know we're 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 worried about or we so far we've just been talking about like the threats of like you know money being stolen, but there definitely is the threat of like the accounting being wrong, and all of a sudden like we realize we have no money because we didn't you know properly ledger and document everything. So there's definitely like there can be vulnerabilities, which is like. Our vulnerability is like our accounting system sucks and we have no way to like actually track the money in and money out. Like that could be the vulnerability and the control would be, let's actually have better like, you know, double ledger accounting or teams that look at this and make sure we're tracking every dollar. Um, awesome. Yeah, I mean, a, f- a few more when, when we also think about, we, we just talked about like financial risk is definitely an issue when we talk about like the sort of the acts of God, like a fire or tornado destroying our bank, um, vulnerabilities there would be, you know, our bank was not designed to withstand a tornado or our vault was not fireproof. Um, And the controls that we could put into place is to like make it more secure, make it more resilient, make it more available uh, and and make make our vault, you know, withstand these types of activities that we are actually worried about happening. Now, when I said going back to being realistic, it's also like, well, if my bank is in Southern California, uh, do I should I should I be designing to protect it against tornadoes? Like, no fires. Yeah, absolutely right. But it's being contextual and realistic. So not you know a tornado is not a realistic threat for every bank everywhere. Uh, so oh, I went too far. So hopefully that was uh, an, an a a. a interesting exercise because what we basically just did against this this fictional bank in the wild west is what we have to do as security professionals all the time for an application or a system we basically just did like a threat model or a vulnerability assessment in our heads against a system in this case the system was the bank but in most cases or like you know in in my day-to-day job the system is like a new microservice that we're deploying or a new api or a new server we're putting on the internet. But we go through the exact same activities of like, what are the threats we're thinking about? Who are the threat actors? What are the vulnerabilities? What are the controls? Now in technical terms, here's how we can actually identify a lot of these threats and vulnerabilities. So there's several different activities that get performed a lot within a security organization. The first is threat modeling. We basically just did a a high level threat model. Um, threat modeling is not necessarily like a hands-on keyboard activity, but it's just whiteboarding and thinking out loud. And this is when you can identify threats and weaknesses or design and validate controls. When we're also talking about application security and code specifically, there's a few things that, like automated tools that can be used to identify weaknesses and risks. The first is static application security testing or SAST, which is a technique that is essentially like spell check for your code. Like you get red squiggly lines, you know, when you're writing in Word, if you spell something wrong. SAST are basically tools that can do that for code and show you vulnerabilities. So they, they, they statically, meaning they don't have to compile it or they don't have to run it, 
but they will just look at your source code and try to identify vulnerabilities and weaknesses in your source code. Another tool or technique is called DAST or dynamic application security testing. The difference there is dynamic scanners will wait until your code is running and exposing like an API or exposing a web page, and then will send probes and requests and try to hit it and find vulnerabilities by actually talking to the code that's running. Another category of tool is called software composition analysis or SCA. This is becoming more and more, I mean, I, I keep saying this every time I give this class and it just becomes more and more important because we see, keep hearing about it with supply chain attacks. Most modern code, I would venture to say, well, I'm not even venture, I think I've seen the studies, but I won't get the exact number right. But like most applications being like deployed right now are up to 90% open source. Like there's really just like a thin layer of code that's being built on top of a lot of open source libraries. You all are doing it with Django and React two open source projects. If you write 100 lines of JavaScript for your React front end, underneath that tip of the iceberg is like a hundred, hundreds of thousands of lines of JavaScript that's in React and the libraries you're using. So though that code that we didn't necessarily write ourselves can have vulnerabilities and things we need to be aware of. And that's what SCA is, is designed to do. It will look at what version of React you're using, what version of all the JavaScript libraries you're using, and are there any publicly known vulnerabilities against them that we need to like bump or upgrade or potentially remove? Hey, Ronnie. Yep. So uh, you mentioned like uh, supply chain attacks. I was just curious what kind of, um, you know, what kind of attacks occur on like the supply chain system? Yeah, um, so supply chain attacks, kind of a, a, a vague term, but when we're talking specifically about like software supply chain attacks, uh, we usually mean what I talked about in terms of like open source components. Um, a great example was, I think it was just like a few weeks ago, there was a JavaScript package that was published to NPM, right? The, the node package manager uh, that had been compromised. Somebody was able to compromise like the open source maintainers credentials. And he put a backdoor into this node package and published it to NPM. And the back door, when it executed, gathered some information about the system, sent it back to him, and I think like did some cryptocurrency mining or, or something. I forget what the exact attack was. But that was published and that existed on NPM. And anyone in the world that happened to do an NPM install for that particular package was infected. That's like a, a really scary example of a supply chain attack. Like you're not even thinking about those types of, of vulnerabilities when you're writing your code. I'm just writing my JavaScript and I'm like, oh, I really wish I had a, a package to tell me if this number is even. It's kind of a joke, I think there is an is even package on NPM, but I'd be like, okay, well, instead of writing it myself, I'm just gonna NPM install it because I see this, this open source package that does it. And then what you don't realize is that was actually backdoored and infected and now your application is affected. Um, that's one open source supply chain attack. Uh, there's another example, which is solar winds. Um, that was a huge breach and attack that also happened fairly recently, um, in which solar winds was a commercial product that massive companies like Microsoft used to monitor their networks internally. And solar winds reached, like if you had a solar wind server, say inside your network, it keeps itself up to date, right? It reaches out and downloads updates. Well, a nation state attacking group got access to the solar winds update server. And, and put backdoor code and malicious code into the SolarWinds updates, and then waited for any company in the world that used SolarWinds to just update their code and got infected and bad code into the network. And Microsoft was affected, we were affected. A lot of any company that was using SolarWinds was affected by this through no really fault of our own. It's just because we trusted the upstream supply chain. Like we trusted SolarWinds to give us updates that were secure and they failed. And we had to account for that. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so yeah, that's why I keep saying like software composition analysis or supply chain analysis is like more and more important. We keep getting popped, like not we Marketa, but just in general, like we keep getting burned by this type of stuff. Like you think you've done everything right. Your code is perfectly safe. It's very secure but you have one dependency on some like vendor 
and they're the ones that are compromised, and then it's all over for you. So the other activities are pen testing and vulnerability scanning. And the main difference between them is automated versus manual, I would say. Uh, a penetration test is a, is a manual test designed to validate controls and identify vulnerabilities. Um, it's actually like me as a human going in and like poking and prodding and trying different things to try to find those vulnerabilities. Whereas vulnerability scanning is usually performed in an automated fashion, scanning all the infrastructure, scanning the application, scanning the um, servers or the containers to find publicly known vulnerabilities. And I put an asterisk here because I uh, am focusing mostly today on this manual aspect. Happy to talk about any of these and I can give like examples of tools we can use or if you wanna talk more about it, we can. But usually in the afternoon, we're going to be doing a quote unquote penetration test ourselves uh, by just manually poking around and finding some vulnerabilities. Uh, this is a, a graph that was made by a colleague or an old, co old coworker of mine. Um, we have a terminology problem. If it's not clear, like in security, like terms are so overloaded and used all the time. And uh, you've probably heard me already say like certain things over and over again, but even the term penetration test or pen test is like really vague at this point. Um, and when we were working together at Neohapsis and Cisco, we'd have customers or clients come to us all the time and say, hey, I want you to do a pen test. And we'd have to ask them to clarify like what do you actually want? Um, and I thought that this was a pretty good like visual aid um, to identify like what sort of different activities could fall under the category of penetration test. And it's really based on the scope, meaning like how much are you looking at? Are you just laser focused on one thing or are you looking at the broader environment and the details that are given to the testers? Do you wanna give them all the information up front, or do you wanna give them nothing and see what they can find out on their own? And those two axes kind of end up calling or making like different areas of penetration testing. Um, where at one end of the spectrum, if the entire company is in scope and there's no details given to the testers, but you've given them permission to do whatever it takes, that's more of a traditional red team. Um, if you're very limited in scope, like looking at one specific thing, and you're giving them all the policy documents and documentation and architecture and everything, then it's really more about compliance and controls validation than it is about like hacking or penetration testing. And then everywhere in the middle is a little bit of a blurry, blurry line. All right. So Manual penetration testing, I think, is the most valuable activity that can be performed, but it's also the most time consuming. So it's not realistic to be able to do this like all the time for everything. I think that knowing how to do this type of manual testing is a really important skill to have, not just for cybersecurity professionals, but for anyone doing web application testing. It's important to know how to be able to test your apps and your code and know what attackers look for and be able to either find them yourself or verify them. Um, if, you know, if, if you end up um, working at a company with like a security department and you're a software engineer and the security department says, hey, we found this vulnerability, can you fix it? Knowing how to actually verify it yourself is like an awesome skill to have because you'll be able to, to develop and fix things a lot faster if you're also able to test specifically for that vulnerability. The other reason that manual pen testing is really valuable is because automated scanners like static analysis and dynamic analysis don't understand context at all. They're just dumb machines, right? They don't really know what they're looking for and the context of the organization in which it's in. Um, there's like a very big difference, right? Like finding like a, a weak password on a critical uh, financial system that gives you access to everything and find that a weak password on like a dummy hello world app that does nothing. As a human within the context, we know that difference. Scanners can't understand that difference. So they would rank both of those the same. So that's why the human touch with like, like a penetration test can actually help a lot here. And I'm teaching you all this because like I've mentioned a few times now, right? I, I really want to empower you to be able to test things yourselves. I'd like to empower, I like to just empower every software engineer or developer that I work with to know enough about security and know how to use some of the tools so they can do this on their own. Um, 
because it, it, it makes them better software engineers. It makes them better developers. And I think it's kind of fun. Uh, now, with that all being said, uh, I'll call this out and I'll call this out again before we actually start doing any hands-on stuff. It's If you do a penetration test against a system that you don't own and you don't have permission to do, that is illegal. Like full stop, that's a crime. So I have to call that out because as I give you uh, information and tools on how to start like poking around on systems and, and finding vulnerabilities or launching scanners, you can only do this against things that you own yourself or you have permission to test. Now, there's actually a lot of really good resources on the internet that give you full permission to test them. Um, and I, I call out like bug bounties uh, because that's like a great way to learn or practice. And it's basically uh, companies that are given explicit permission. Uh, if you look at like Facebook or Meta, whatever they're called now, their bug bounties they've publicly said we welcome anyone to actually try to pen test us or find vulnerabilities in our systems and we'll pay you if you find something that's permission you can do it if a company doesn't have a bug bounty program or is a lot more private about that you have to be much more careful you can't just start launching attacks against like public facing web servers um, or you can get in trouble uh awesome made it through the first section um if it's all right with everyone, I'm thinking of just like a five minute break so I can go refill some coffee. It seems like a good uh, stopping point. So uh, I will mute and turn my camera off. And well, before I do that, actually, it's also a good before we jump into like the next section, let me pause and ask, are there any questions or conversations we wanna have now about that previous like high level security concept section? Sorry, should have done that before the break. I have a quick question. How much of the yeah. the security work is typically done like in-house versus outsourced? I know it would be very dependent upon the size of the company, but it seems like something that's ripe for being outsourced just because having an expert is, is very worthwhile and it probably doesn't need to change on an extremely regular basis. Uh, it depends on the activity. So let me, let me go back here. Uh, so one I, one thing I could put on the slide is sort of like how often these things should be performed. Um, threat modeling doesn't need to be performed all the time. It really should be performed when you're building something new. Static analysis, dynamic analysis, and software composition analysis, however, should be performed all the time. Like any new line of code you write, any bug fix, any regular schedule, like you should be running those types of things to identify the vulnerabilities. Pen testing and vulnerability scanning are the most like labor intensive or time intensive, resource intensive. Uh, those generally are done like on a cadence. Um, and there's actually compliance reasons to do this. Like a lot of times companies have to have one pen test a quarter or one pen test a year uh, in order to satisfy like regulations. So those are usually done scheduled. So to answer your question, yeah, things like penetration testing and potentially even things like threat modeling are out frequently. Because if you're only doing one pen test a quarter, one pen test a year, maybe having that expertise in-house of like a dedicated pen tester isn't necessarily a great you know, use of, of time or resources, unless they're working on other things, which by the way is like how we do it at Marketo. Like we're, we're, I'm pen tester, but I only do one pen test a quarter or like one, one or two pen tests a year. And then most of my day job is something else. We just have that, that expertise in-house. Um, but static, like the actual scanning of code, the testing of code, um, isn't necessarily something that you can really outsource, although it is something you can buy. There's open source tools that do this, but there's also commercial tools that do this. And um, most companies or organizations will either use open source tools that are free, but require like, you know, more tuning or buy a, buy a tool off the shelf that can do like static analysis, dynamic analysis, software composition analysis. And then you do probably need, you know, a resource on staff that understands those tools and can help like manage them or tune them. Um, but it's not like a full-time position that's just doing scanning. Uh, that's that's how Marketa has it. We have a suite of SAS, DAS, and SCA tools. My team manages them, but managing doesn't really mean much. We actually just give training to the engineers and then the engineers use the tools and the tools are just like automated in GitHub and it happens for us. 
Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? All right. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too dry. I know that, that was like very high level, just security concepts. We're actually gonna, when we get back from this coffee break, jump more into like technical discussions around web apps and start applying those concepts specifically to like code and web security. So awesome. Cheers. <laughs> And we'll jump back into it. All right, this next section I kind of call Web 101 Back to Basics. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that I think it's really important and, and I like when I'm teaching new concepts to make sure we're building across like a solid foundational understanding and foundational knowledge. So this is really just a, a quick-ish section over what is the web, what technologies make up the web. Um, I, I know it seems kind of silly, like when we're already writing web applications and working in this field, but some of these concepts I think are actually really important when we start talking about the vulnerabilities because we will identify how the vulnerabilities affect some of the core technologies uh, that make up like modern web applications. Uh, so it, feel free again, uh, throughout this entire section, if something is not clear, just ask, uh, you can, ask in chat or unmute. I also like to do it this way because I've noticed that a lot of security education, like when you take like a, a security course or uh, someone comes in like a security educator, like we jump right into talking about like the attacks, like boom, this is SQL injection, boom, this is cross-site scripting, boom, this is CSERF, um, without necessarily discussing the underlying security principles. So that's kind of what we did when we did the bank exercises, like some of these underlying, underlying principles of like what makes secure, security. And now we're going to talk about some of the te technological principles that get abused and misused uh, by these attacks. In my experience, fixing security bugs in web apps can sometimes be like plain whack-a-mole where things just keep popping up and you just like try to put a Band-Aid on it. Um, and I've worked with a lot of development teams and like and, and, and engineers that this has been the case when it seems like every single week we find the new cross-site scripting vulnerability. And like every single week, it's another like emergency patch or a hot fix. And, and I think it's easier to get ahead of that when we can address like core underlying issues. Like why, why do we even have cross-site scripting? Like what is cross-site scripting? And then instead of just trying to find each individual one on every line of code. And some of these concepts are actually really hard like um, and easy to get mixed up. And even very experienced developers and peers of mine, and even me all the time, I like mix up certain concepts, things like cores and CSERF and XSS. There's all these acronyms and there's different ways they interact like with web browsers and security. Um, but understanding why attacks work the way they do means it's easier to learn how to defend against them. That's really my, my position. And so we're gonna focus a lot on the why. Uh, and then we'll talk, of course, like a little bit on how to defend, but I think understanding the why is almost more important than knowing how to defend. All right, so Web 101. Um, what are the main web technology, you know, technologies that power the, oh yeah, if the military is prepared you for anything exactly, it was perfect. I'm gonna throw them all at you then. What are the main technologies that power the, the amazing World Wide Web, the internet that's full of tubes and, and gets you know cat pictures across the internet, across the world in microseconds? Um, more acronyms, but these are the core technologies. HTTP, Hypertext Transit Protocol, or Transfer Protocol. Um, when we say HTTP, HTTP is the protocol, meaning it is a well-defined like set of standards on how data can be transferred between point A and point B. It doesn't care or have an opinion on like what the data is. It's just how data gets transferred between point A and point B. So HTTP is a protocol. It is also a plain text protocol, which means that the protocol is based on English words. 
uh, you can actually read and see the words. So we'll talk about what HTTP and some of the verbs and stuff, but it's actually designed to be read by humans and implemented by humans. Even though generally humans aren't talking HTTP, it's two servers talking HTTP to each other, but it's designed for hum human readability. And it's generally occurring over ports 80 and 443. So those are the TCP, like one layer down at the networking stack, um, what HTTP talks on. 80 is for HTTP and 443 is for HTTPS, which is encrypted HTTP. HTML, on the other hand, is a language. It's not a protocol. And I get these mixed up all the time and, and catch me if I ever say it wrong because I'll say HTTP when I mean HTML and I'll say HTML when I mean HTTP sometimes. But HTML is the markup language that it describes to the browser what a page should look like, how a page should look. It's also not a programming language. HTML is not a complete or traditional programming language. You cannot do you know, advanced logic or other things in HTML like you can in Python. Um, it's just a markup language that has a set of like expected formats and words that when constructed can outline what a page should look like. So HTML is in the exact same realm as XML or JSON. It's just a way to display data uh, or actually just a way to like organize data in this markup language. CSS, uh, cascading style sheets, I believe, uh, is basically just styling metadata that gets associated to HTML. It's like an additional like add-on to HTML that's used to give instructions on how to render the HTML pretty, um, like what color things should be, where they should be. Uh, it's kind of an addition or extension to HTML. It can actually be embedded in HTML or it can be a separate file that's imported. Um, and it's also not a programming language, just a way to represent data. I think I saw a hand go up or virtual hand go up. Hey, Ronnie, I just want to ask a question about um, yep. HTTPS. Yes. So generally, I always hear like HTTPS is like encrypted. I was just trying to get an idea of like, how, how does it differ from HTTCP and like on what level is it encrypted? Like what, what do people mean when they say it's encrypted? Yeah, uh, great question. And uh, it, I'll answer it now, but I think it'll also be a lot more clear because one of the first things we'll do with the hands-on lab is decrypt HTTPS so we can see it. So I think um, you'll you'll understand it there. But uh, essentially, HTTP um, is a plain text protocol. So if I send data to a website like Google.com, I log in with my username and my password. My username and my password are actually just going to be pasted in the HTTP content that goes out over the internet. Um, and if it's not HTTPS, so I'm just talking HTTP over port 80. Anyone in the network path that can just like look at the packets that are going across the network would be able to read my username and password because it's plain text and it's right there. It's just, you know, bits on the wire, but it's not encrypted. HTTPS is an encryption layer on top of that. Uh, basically, what would happen is I'm getting ahead of myself because I have a slide later to discuss this. But when I when I try to connect to Google, Google will present a certificate and then we'll set up basically an encryption key between my browser and Google. And then I'm still using HTTP. It's actually the exact same HTTP method, but right before that goes out, all of that is encrypted with a key that only Google knows and then sent out over the internet. So then if anyone is on the network and looks at the data that's coming from my laptop, they would see encrypted gibberish. And the only person in the entire world that can decrypt that gibberish is Google server itself. Uh, so that, that's kind of where the encryption takes place. Uh, encryption actually takes place at a layer below HTTP. Um, are, you all, are, are you familiar with like kind of the, the OSI layer of, of, of uh, OSI model of like layers, like application layer, network layer? No, not quite yet. I haven't seen that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, sorry. It'd be easier if I had a, a visual aid. But uh, essentially... There's an applicate. There's the application layer, which is HTTP. That's the the code, and then one layer below that is you could call it the network layer, and that that dictates like how things get transferred between two points, right? I'm really oversimplifying here, but the network can be like an Ethernet cable, a LAN, a Wi-Fi, cellular connection, and then it goes across the internet and undersea cables, and you know that's the networking layer, 
And the networking layer doesn't care what it sends. All it does is just send packets. When we joke that the internet's a series of tubes, the tubes are the network. Um, for HTTPS, the encryption is in the tubes. The encryption is not actually at the application layer. That's kind of the best like simple explanation I could give, but hopefully it'll make more sense when we, when we see it in action. Was that helpful? Oh yeah, that was very helpful. It makes a lot more sense now. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, and actually thanks for asking that because I think that is something maybe I should add to the slide is like, there's no difference between HTTP and HTTPS in terms of what the code looks like. They're the exact same protocol. HTTPS is just HTTP wrapped in encryption, um, but it's not like it's a totally separate technology. Awesome. Um, okay, so you, you, a lot of you have probably heard of HTTP, HTML, and CSS. Uh, this last one is actually a really important concept that uh, is, I think, probably a lot less known. Um, it's called the document object model, or DOM. And the DOM is what web browsers construct and then display to you. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, when a web browser like Firefox gets a bunch of HTML and CSS, it constructs in its, in its memory and in, in the browser, a document object model. And that basically is like laying out the hierarchy of what should be on the web page colorizing it, styling it with CSS, and then it renders the DOM visually on your screen. So when you're clicking around and looking at a web page and there's a button here and there's a menu here and there's a picture here, in the browser that's represented at, virtually as a document object model or DOM. So it kind of looks like this. If, if Firefox you know, goes to www.example.com, the first thing that happens is example.com and Firefox start talking over HTTP. Then over that HTTP, example.com sends HTML and it sends CSS. Firefox then reads all the HTML and CSS and constructs a DOM and then displays the DOM to you on your browser page. Ronnie, um, yes. we've we've talked about DOM quite a bit. Oh, awesome. And I'm, one thing that I'm trying to, I'm still trying to wrap my head around with the DOM is, is it just like a language of abstraction that we're using to say like the DOM is the HTML and the CSS being represented by the browser? Or is it actually like the browser's creating like some other file that it is then rendering, which is called like, I don't know, dot dom or something like that you know and i don't know if these details are really that important but it's just kind of like it's still a little hazy for me there and maybe that's just because you know i haven't done the deep dive but i'm just i don't know if that even makes sense but i i think it makes sense and um i'll i'll try to simplify it and not just because uh it's easier to explain but also because i'll be honest like I don't have a, a deep enough understanding of how browsers are written, but essentially, right, you have various different browsers that all have to implement like a certain set of web standards, right? Firefox is actually much a much different code base than Chrome, but they can both be used, right, to, re to render pages. So web browsers understand HTML, they understand CSS, and they understand JavaScript, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, all of those interact with each other. And then the DOM is an in-memory representation of that. So it's not a file that gets written anywhere. It's basically just a, a structure in memory, um, like in, in Python, like a class, or in JavaScript, right? Like a class or an object that you're instantiating. It's just an object or a class in memory that is, consi that is basically always rendered uh, live on the page. So the thing that the, the magic happens with like dynamic web pages is that if you change the DOM in memory, it instantly refreshes on the page. So that it's always displaying the DOM, but there's like methods and, you know, I guess the, yeah, if, if you want to stick with like the Python uh, uh, analogy here, if the DOM is a class, it has const a constructor, it has methods, and then it has like variables. And you can call the methods to change the variables. And when you change a variable, your page looks differently. Is that, does that make sense? It does help I, I, a I lot. Thank you very much, Ronnie. So if I can, sorry, if I can try to make this clear for myself. So like, if we're thinking about old technology, you know, those um, projectors that people used to use and 
our teachers used to use and write on. Yeah. So would the like the pay, the transparency that the um, the teacher is writing on sort of be the DOM because it's automatically trans um, shown on the screen and they can write and change it continuously. Is that sort of what it's like? Yeah, I think yeah, I think that analogy is good. Yeah, um, you can kind of think yeah the the transparent like page that you write on is the dom but um when it's when it's rendered right like projected through onto the screen so the students can see it like that's what you're actually seeing like in your firefox page or your chrome page um and html and css and javascript are basically giving you the instructions on how to write on that transparent page and when you write on the transparent page add something remove something it's instantly reflected on like what you see thank you that's good yep um I mean, what, yeah, maybe, I don't know if this would be helpful. So I'm looking at my slides right now, right? Like this, this is the page that's rendered by Chrome for me. Um, if I, I guess I have to find like a blank page or let's just go to Google, right? This is the page that's rendered, it, at least in Chrome, right? If you go right click and then hit inspect, here's the DOM. Like this is that basically you can think of like up here is what's presented down here is the DOM and and then as I'm like hovering my mouse, you can actually see like the DOM representation of what I'm visually seeing. So this is the Google logo and if I go uh, into this button and right click and hit inspect it should take me right down here. Here's the DOM code DOM representation. I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying because actually this is H, like this is code, but in memory it's a DOM. Uh, and if I were to modify this, like you can actually, you know, click on this and start changing things. And you'll notice I changed ASDF down here and my page rendered and changed up here. Like now the button, instead of saying Google search says ASDF. And likewise, I could click find that in the DOM and I could say like, hello world. And I hit enter and now it's reflected and changed up here. So that's the that's the relationship between like the DOM, like I'm down here, you know, writing on that transparent thing or erasing things and modifying it, and it's projecting up here in the visual page that's displayed to the user. Does that help? It does. Yes, it Thanks does. for diving into that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool. If, if you've never done that before, by the way, like this is this is how people fake like fake tweets and things like that or like fake your bank account balance i mean all you have to do is just like rent like open a tweet on twitter like find it in the dom and you can change it to say whatever you want and then take a screenshot of it and it'll look just like a real tweet or i can like go into my bank account balance like find that element change it in the dom to say i've got a billion dollars in the bank and then take a screenshot of it and like you know impress someone i have had way too much fun with that <laughs> i'm not gonna lie yep yeah so basically that's what uh that that's what the dom looks or that's how you can mess with the dom and sort of the relationship between the dom and what gets displayed yeah great great question uh, cool all right so the the biggie the big technology that we're going to we have to talk about because uh, it's eating the world is JavaScript, right? In in the world of like our web technologies, like JavaScript is definitely king because um, it's the most powerful thing we have at our disposal. So as opposed to HTML, which I said is like just a markup language, JavaScript is a complete programming language. You can do anything and everything in JavaScript. Um, every browser, Chrome, Firefox, uh, Edge, Safari, they have their own JavaScript engine that executes JavaScript code. So you can feed a browser JavaScript code and the browser knows how to execute it as a complete programming language. Just like you have a Python interpreter, browsers have a JavaScript interpreter built into them. And where the power comes from is JavaScript has full read and write control of the DOM. So JavaScript owns the DOM or can own the DOM and completely do whatever it wants to the DOM. And that is how modern web apps look so cool and dynamic and you know can can 
present things and animate things is because they make super heavy use of JavaScript and they program JavaScript to manipulate the DOM and do things like dynamically and really cool. The other thing that JavaScript has is full access to browser storage. So the browser has to remember things. It has to store things. Um, it, it has different storage mechanisms and it also has things called cookies. And I'll talk about both of those in a sec. Uh, JavaScript has access to those, can read, write. Then browsers also have various APIs. Uh, I guess I'm on Zoom right now, but if I was on like Google Hangout, for example, which is running inside Chrome, um, I'm actually, it's JavaScript talking to a Chrome API to read my webcam and my microphone. Um, and then that's talking to my underlying operating system. So browsers have all these APIs that you can talk to like webcams and microphones and get your location. You can actually talk to USB devices. You can do a lot within the browser with JavaScript. And then a really important point is browsers and the teams that make browsers are extremely cautious about executing JavaScript because it's too powerful. Like it's too dangerous to do willy nilly, like with no controls in place. So browsers will always execute JavaScript in a sandbox to really limit what it, ha what it has access to. Um, which is why if you've like used Chrome before, you'll see like a pop-up that'd be like, hey, this page wants to use your location. Do you allow it? Or this page wants to use your webcam. Do you want to allow it? Like they have to put those controls in place so that JavaScript can't just take control of your of your webcam any, on any page that you land on, right? That's the, that's kind of what the sandbox is doing. Um, oops, I keep going. Uh, so on that note, I mean, I maybe I'll switch over real quick just to to talk more about this DOM and Google. Um, a lot of modern pages, maybe Google is not the best example, but a lot of modern pages uh, use majority JavaScript and not even much HTML. Um, and if we right click and look at like view page source, yeah, okay, this is a bad example because there's a lot of JavaScript in here. Um, but in, we'll say in like the initial web, like back in like the 90s or what, uh, when I was writing my first web website and posting it to like FTP servers, there was no JavaScript. Like what I wrote in HTML was what you saw. Like there was no intermediary step. Like you wrote HTML and then it was rendered into the DOM and that was it. Modern web pages like barely write HTML anymore. In fact, if we just like look at this Google source page, um, there's like not any HTML really in here. It's just a bunch of JavaScript functions that are defined and like one HTML tag up here. But what happens is when all of this is loaded, JavaScript just takes over and JavaScript writes this entire DOM for us. So it, that's how like modern web apps, and that's, what's, that's what you do when you're writing a React app. But like you're not even really writing HTML anymore. You're just writing JavaScript to take control of your DOM and render it for you. Which is good and bad. It's nice that you don't have to just like write raw HTML anymore, um, but it also makes things a little bit more right, complicated or harder to follow when you just have JavaScript doing everything for you. Uh, okay, so quick review of what HTTP is. I said that it's plain text, so you can actually just read HTTP. Normally you don't get exposed to this, but this is what the browser is doing when it talks to the server. Um, and everything is in ASCII, so you can read it, and it uses common words and verbs, things like get, post, date, expires, like these are, these are actual specs in the protocol. One thing to note about HTTP um, that's, has security implications is HTTP is what's called a stateless protocol, which means that when a client and a server are talking to each other, they don't remember that they're talking to each other out of the box, like by default. Uh, every time a client sends something to a server or every time the server responds to the client, it's kind of like the first time they've ever talked to each other as far as they're aware. Like that's the protocol was not designed to ever remember that you're talking to somebody and like have a continuous conversation with them. So in order for like browsers or web apps to like keep you logged in and remember things, they have to add stuff into HTTP. Um, and, and so state, when I say state, I really mean like the, the you remember that you're talking to me, like we have state between each other uh, is really an addition on top of HTTP. It's not like built into HTTP.
since HTTP is a plain text protocol, I mean, like it's actually just written in English words, there's certain characters that are special. And if you want to include special characters in HTTP, you have to be careful because new line characters, for example, actually mean something when you're interpreting HTTP. So if you want to send a new line character over HTTP, but not have it interpreted as HTTP, you have to encode it. And quick call out, because it's easy to, to mix up the terms, but encoding something is not the same as encrypting something. So those terms are not inter interchangeable. When we encode something, we ought, we're, we're not doing anything security related to it at all. There's no security benefit whatsoever from encoding something. It's not about security. It is just about changing data from like one representation to another. And web apps today use all sorts, uh, use not all sorts, but several, uh, a few different types of encoding, but they use it all the time. So it can be useful to be able to identify and understand the most common ones. So on the right here are some examples. I have the string hello world with an exclamation point. That's ASCII or Unicode. That's just like rendered you know, letters. URL encoding, this is the exact same string, hello world with an exclamation point, but in URL encoding. HTML encoding, ASCII hex, base64, or sometimes only the special characters like spaces and exclamation points are encoded. So you might see hello, then space becomes plus and exclamation point becomes percent 21. Have you all seen some of this type of encoding before? Yeah, of course. Yep. Perfect. Uh, I've never seen base64 encoding. I'm just curious, is that like, is that like base 64, or like, or is that like on base 10, but instead of like 10 different characters, it's 64 different characters? Uh, yeah, essentially. So base 64. Oh, so how would that work? Uh, I'm just so, curious. Because uh, we only have like 26, um, 26 alphabetic letters and then like 10 digits. So base 64 is case sensitive. So you've got 26 times two because lowercase and uppercase. Uh, which is what 52, and then you've got 10 letters, zero through or 10 numbers, zero through nine, and then the other characters that base 64 uses are plus symbols and equal symbols, uh, or slashes too, right? Or is that 64? Anyways, there, you can get there. It's basically uppercase, lowercase numbers, and a couple of a couple special symbols, and you've got 64 different characters, and then you can uh, render any data you want in base 64. Um, which, like you said, you know, would be different than base 10. I mean, you could also, technically, I could encode hello world into base 10, like decimal. I could do it in base 16. Well, base 16 is actually hex, right? Um, and, or I could do base 58, I think someone I saw mentioned, but it's just not very useful. It's not very common. Uh, you're either going to see base 16, which is hex, or base 64, which is this. Yeah, that was that's really interesting. Yep. All right. So now let's talk about state. Um, I mentioned right the whenever a, a server and a client talk HTTP, they have no idea if they've ever talked to each other before. There's nothing in the protocol that like remembers conversations or connections between two different entities. So. What this means is that when you have a web server that talks HTTP, it has to accept everything that's sent to it and then make a decision later uh, on whether or not it should like respond. Um, because it doesn't know like any request that you send to it, it has no way to distinguish whether it's like a brand new request or someone it's talked to before or someone that it trusts. So cookies um, or kind of an addition to HTTP in the browsers, uh, and I mean, looking back at it, it's like I, I kind of look at cookies as a little bit of like a hacky way to add session information to HTTP, but it, it's what they're designed to do. Um, if I like the analogy I like to use for cookies is like a if you're at an amusement park and you leave the park and you want to come back, how they give you a wristband or a stamp, and then you can show that wristband or that stamp, and the person at the gate knows that you've been there before and you are who you say you are, and they let you back in. That's essentially how cookies work when we're talking HTTP. The first time I talk to a server and say, hello, um, I'd like to start talking to you, they'll give me a stamp or a wristband, AKA a cookie. 
And then every single subsequent request I send, I send the exact same cookie and the server knows who I am then. Like it's just a way to identify every part of every new part of our conversation uh, as that cookie is a unique stamp to me. Cookies then in that case are basically an identifier, right? That the server can use to remember who it's talking to and what clients it are. So they, they have to be unique for each person or each client, AKA each browser. Um, and they're useful for, of course, like keeping you logged into sites so you don't have to constantly put your username and password in there. They also can be super annoying because they're also used for like advertising and tracking clients. Like your browser gets stamped with all these unique identifiers and then they can track you on different sites that you go to. Where security comes into play is browsers are extremely quote unquote helpful in that they, they will accept any cookie and they'll send cookies whenever they want, not whenever they want, but whatever they can. Um, and that, that's designed as a convenience factor because you shouldn't have to think about, you know, I wanna send my cookie to this site. Um, so your cookie just gets sent automatically. But that has implications, uh, especially around privacy and tracking, right? Is that you don't have control over like cookies that are given to you and sent to you. So you could hit some site and have no idea that you're actually being identified by visiting that site because a cookie was sent. Um, and then there's also some security vulnerabilities that come from that as well. Besides cookies, there's also ways to store information in the browser. Cookies is one way that the server can like give you information and your browser remembers it. But there's two other ways, two, at least two other ways. The, the popular ones are local storage and session storage. These are APIs essentially that JavaScript can leverage to save information in the browser. They're sort of like an in-browser database at your disposal. Difference between local storage and session storage is Local storage, if you close your browser, will be there when you open the browser back up. Session storage, if you close your window, gets wiped away. So temporary versus more semi-permanent um, database. And JavaScript has complete control to local storage and session storage. JavaScript doesn't necessarily have access to cookies, but always has access to browser storage. The difference between things that are in browser storage and things that are in cookies is browser storage, like I said, uh, is different than cookies because browser stuff that's in browser storage is never automatically sent. You have to explicitly tell the browser to send what you want to send. Whereas cookies, there's this like magic thing that happens where a lot of stuff just gets sent automatically and you don't necessarily have control over it. And uh, here we're gonna introduce like new important terms for security. Cookies are scoped to a domain, but only available to JavaScript within the origin. Browser storage is isolated entirely by the origin. So now we have to talk about and explain the difference between domains and origins. Oh, I guess not yet. I guess my slides are out of order. That'll come uh, in like the next slide. This slide, uh, this slide was supposed to happen before. Um, few other concepts that I'll just run through really quickly is how we can get browsers to actually make HTTP requests to talk over the internet. Uh, there's two distinct but important ways that browsers can make outbound HTTP connections. The traditional way is I go to Chrome and I type in google.com and I hit enter. That's the traditional way. As soon as I tell the browser I want to talk to something, the browser goes out and fetches it. Um, when that happens, my page changes, what the, the browsing context changes. And these traditional requests are what include the cookies automatically. Um, the other way that traditional requests can be triggered is purely through HTML. So if we define a remote image with a source tag or a remote script or a style sheet or an iframe, the browser will actually make a request to each of these resources for us. Some of them also require like an event, like, a, like submitting a form. So if we have this HTML and we hit submit, again, the browser will make that request. On the other hand, we have the JavaScript way. 
um, which is using a browser API called XML HTTP request or fetch on uh, newer browsers. And this is also kind of called Ajax programming or asynchronous JavaScript and XML. But it's a this is how JavaScript, like running in the background of your web app, can make and fetch resources in the background. Main difference is that these Ajax requests can happen silently and invisibly to the user. So you can be browsing like one page, like gmail.com, and it looks like your page is static and nothing's happening. But in the background, JavaScript is firing off continuous requests to, to identify if you have any new emails or not. All right, all of that's kind of leading to now like the security model of browsers and JavaScript. Um, like I mentioned, the teams that build web browsers are really smart and have thought about this because they recognize that what they were doing was pretty dangerous. Um, when you put a JavaScript interpreter inside a browser and then let any website give you JavaScript and then execute that JavaScript, that's a recipe for disaster if you don't have good security controls in place. So browsers address this by putting strict limits on what JavaScript can do and access and execute. And this is, this is one of the big differences between like Node.js and like JavaScript that runs in your browser, right? You can run JavaScript on a server and serve like an entire like, you know, web server in JavaScript, or you can have scripts that run on your, on your Mac that you run with Node. Technically it's the same language, but Node has no limitations. Node can do almost anything, right? The JavaScript that runs in the browser is much more, much more severely limited. So the, the code that you write for like server-side JavaScript will not work in a browser because the browser just won't allow it. And browsers do this through two main security boundaries. One I, I mentioned once is the sandbox. Um, the idea of the sandbox is that any JavaScript that executes inside your browser should never, ever, under any circumstance, be able to exit your browser and talk to your operating system. You sh like JavaScript that I'm running on my in my browser should never be able to read my documents folder, or should never be able to like read my host name or my IP address or anything like that. Like it has to stay within the browser, and that's the sandbox. The other way is even within the sandbox. JavaScript should, that's executing can only see and access data associated with the origin that it was loaded from. So in our, in our uh, rough diagram here, right, when we have the DOM, we have storage, we have cookies, we have browser APIs, JavaScript is running inside a sandbox here. It's also limited by the same origin policy so that it can only talk to the DOM, the storage, the browser APIs, and the cookies that are associated with this origin. So who's who's heard of the same origin policy? Has this has this come up in the in any of your web development classes or? Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm happy. To, like I'm I'm the reason I put this in here is like this is in my opinion same origin policy is such a foundational security control for the web, but it's oftentimes just like ignored or like not really discussed when we talk about web security. So. Without the same origin policy, the web would be a very, very dangerous place. Because the same origin policy limits JavaScript within the same browser from talking to basically different domains or different origins. So our example here is example.com can give us JavaScript. And that example.com JavaScript can do whatever it wants to the page. It can do whatever it wants to our cookies. It can do whatever it wants to our storage, but only as it pertains to example.com. Example.com's JavaScript should never ever be allowed to ever talk to my bank's DOM or my bank's cookies, right? Like chase.com is a separate origin. It has to be protected. And this big red X is exactly what the same origin policy does. Hey, Ronnie, I have a yep. quick question. Uh, we, sure. we talked about local storage and session storage. Yes. If we have two different websites, let's say, you know, example.com and donuts.com, um, yep. can they both read my local storage Really, as in, is that protected? Like, is local storage kind of like segmented per web page, or um, was it kind of available to any browser and anyone can read it if you have data in there? Uh, no. So, yes, good question. Local storage and session storage are absolutely subject to the same origin policy. So, 
you can only read local storage for donuts.com if you're on donuts.com. Chase.com, like JavaScript on chase.com, cannot read and has no visibility at all into local storage for donuts.com. They're very, they're very strictly segregated and segmented within your browser. All right, and then a uh, related question, if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. it, for the same origin, if I you know, log in with my account for Chase, and then let's say I log out, and then you, know, uh, you log in on the same browser, does, does Chase have access to my previous, like does that session still have access to whatever's in local storage from my login? Like how does that kind of work if, you, if you're able to speak about it? Yeah, uh, that's a really interesting question. So it, it could. And that's not actually, but that's not actually like a, a browser security concern. Like browsers cannot, uh, cannot fix that. Um, but it is entirely up to how Chase handles their logout functionality. So ideally, um, and, and actually we call this out as a security vulnerability. Like when I log out of chase.com, chase.com better delete all my sensitive data from my browser. If they don't, then the scenario you, you described could just occur. Because to the brow like the browser has no concept of like, oh, two different people are talking to me. The browser is the same browser. It doesn't know that, you know, that it's like Ronnie or Joe who's talking, who's actually using the browser. Um, and that's why, you know, you, you uh, if you've ever been on like a shared computer at a hotel or in a library, you know, sometimes you open it up and you realize someone left their login. Um, that is not something the browser can solve. That's something that the application has to solve when it does the logout logic. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I think I see a virtual hand up. Yeah, I was, I was just kind of curious if, uh, like, read like heard about how like Facebook used cookies to track people across multiple websites. Mm -hmm. um, it, were they getting around this kind of same origin policy or was it because they were like providing like a third party service to those websites? I, I don't know if that's something that's way beyond the scope of this, but I was kind of curious. No, it's definitely in scope for this. Uh, and actually um, this, what you're describing has leads to some security concerns. So I, I will, uh, I'll give a spoiler that's coming up a little bit later in the slides. Cookies don't necessarily have to follow the same origin policy. The same origin policy is for JavaScript. Um, but it wasn't necessarily designed to protect against cross-origin or cross-domain cookies. So there's ways that cookies can be crafted and minted and given such that they can be shared and sent to multiple different domains. And that's how like tracking and advertising cookies work. But great question. I love that you're already thinking of that because that's, that's absolutely a concern. Um, and it's kind of why cookies are just really annoying from both the security and privacy perspective. Like same origin policy is very clear and very strict for JavaScript, but JavaScript and same origin policy came at years and years after cookies did. So it's like when cookies were kind of invented and baked in, there wasn't all these concerns that we had. Now I think if 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 there was like the web consortium like redefining like you know web 3.0 or web 4.0 and we're starting from the ground up, I don't think cookies would ever have made it in. Um, but that's kind of the situation we're in right now. Did you hear about how Google's trying to um, get rid of third-party cookies from the Chrome yep. browser? Yep. Yeah. So uh, thankfully, there's been improvements in cookies for sure. Like we haven't been able to kill them. Um, we can't really just like get rid of them. But new browsers are putting additional flags and controls on cookies that like Chrome and, and Google's leading the way. There's new ways now that like you can protect cookies from being sent to other domains um, and treating cookies a little bit more like JavaScript, like that they belong to the same origin policy, but they're all just kind of like add-ons or fixes to a, a, a core technology that's been around for like 30 years. Hey, Ronnie, I had a question too, mm -hmm. just kind of randomly, but so for example, with that Facebook cookie thing where they, they could track other sites you go to. So if you were on Facebook and you cleared your cookies after you left that site, would they still be able to obviously track you further down the road with other sites or? Would that cut that connection right there? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the answer is it depends. I'd have to like look at what cookies Facebook is giving you, um, right? Generally, yeah, if you clear your cookies or if you open like a private browser that, you know, when you do like a new private window or incognito, usually that starts from a clean slate where you have no cookies. Um, 
then you're not going to necessarily be able to be tracked. But it wouldn't take you long to get picked up again. So, right, if you if you went back, if you cleared your cookies and then you logged back into Facebook, like you're right back where you started from. But yeah, there is like a time period there. And, you know, some, some people, like friends of mine that are very like, I don't want to say tinfoil hat, but very like privacy concerned and security concerned about all this stuff, um, use things like browser extensions that will like block cookies, clear cookies, track cookies, um, uh, and, you know, do fully anonymous browsing without cookies and things like that. There, there's ways you can do it, but really you know, out of the box, it's a pretty pervasive problem. I mean, if I'm curious now, like if we want to see what my cookie situation is on So for this domain, basically for live.com, which is Microsoft's domain, uh, I've got this many cookies for OneDrive, then there's more cookies here, and then there's more cookies here and here and here. So you can, I mean, I haven't done anything. I just opened my slides, but like this is, and it's not very user-friendly. I'm not, you know, you're looking at this being like, I have no idea what this is. It's probably a tracking cookie, but I couldn't tell you. Um, but all this stuff just gets thrown into your browser. Perfect, thanks. So is the only thing that prevents um, JavaScript from going across website, the fact that the browser companies are following this law? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, it, it's not a law, like they're not gonna go to jail if they don't do this, but um, they would have no credibility uh, as a browser if they, did, if they did not allow it. So it is a standard, right? This is like, this is set, um, as a standard that you need to implement if you want to be a compliant browser. So technically, like you could write yourself a web browser and not implement same origin policy, but no one would want to use it because it'd be wildly insecure. So yes, we, we put basically all our faith into Chrome's team, Safari's team, Firefox's team to actually make sure that they implement same origin policy. Ronnie, I know you're getting a lot of questions, but no, just, I love it. Keep it coming. <laughs> this is really interesting stuff. Um, for the sandbox you were talking about, uh, for the JavaScript, JavaScript sandbox, I know oftentimes when I'm using web, uh, different web apps, they will ask me for permission to maybe access like something on my computer. And is that that when I'm basically saying, hey, code, you're allowed to run outside of my browser kind of thing? For example, um, Maybe uh, I up I upload a document. You know, it might say, "Hey, we want to have access to uh, you know some folder or something like that." Uh, I'm trying to think of something specific, but I don't know. I'm curious there. Yeah. Um, essentially, yes. Uh, so I guess the way you could kind of think of it is like the sandbox is like really big castle walls around your JavaScript, and they can't get anything out of there. Uh, when you're on a page and like you want to upload a file and it asks like do you want permission or could you know do you want to give chrome permission to read your files or something like that um if you hit allow it's not like you've just destroyed the castle walls really what you've done is given permission to like open a window and do one specific thing so the browsers are are much more granular in the permissions it's not an all or nothing thing where like the sandbox is either up or it's not um, and those like windows through the castle walls are the APIs that the browser exposes. So the browser exposes APIs for file uploads, for webcam, for microphones, for location. And then they actually talk with, the, with outside the browser, but in a very secure and limited fashion. Um, so when, when you're doing it that way, it's not like you're totally destroying all the security benefit you get from the sandbox. You're actually using the sandbox in like the design fashion, which is block everything by default, but only allow certain things uh, and only on request. And there's there's plenty of things that can never be allowed. Like there are no APIs to actually do. Um, uh, like just like, you know, arbitrary code execution or like popping up like a new application or something like that is just not allowed. There's no API for it. So the only way JavaScript would ever be able to do that is to find a sandbox escape. And that's that's a term that you'll probably like hear every once in a blue moon or probably at least like actually once a year when someone discovers a sandbox escape boom. That's a really bad deal. That's really bad. Um, and people like there's competitions that I think pay like a million dollars per sandbox escape phone. Like that's kind of the price they go for. Uh, if you find a sandbox escape in Chrome or a major browser, 
that's a, a tier zero critical vulnerability that's going to affect everybody. Because basically what you've found is a way to break out of that sandbox and execute JavaScript on anyone's laptop or anyone's machine. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Yep. Uh, great questions. Yeah, I love I love talking about this stuff. This is like the fun security modeling and security architecture of the web. Uh, and we haven't even really gotten into any technical like vulns yet. But I love the way you're all thinking because it's like all the vulns we talk about like directly affect or bypass certain things that we're talking about here. So uh, obviously the SOP is very important. Without it, the web would be a very dangerous place. And this is a really like contrived example, but you could imagine if the same origin policy didn't exist, then I would just host a attacker.ropnop.com page that had JavaScript that just talked to Chase and talked to Amazon and did things like, like transferred me money or bought me MacBooks. And if you visited my page, your browser would just go transfer me money and, and buy me MacBooks. But all of this is denied by the same origin policy because attacker.ropnop.com can't talk to Chase and it can't talk to Amazon and it can't use your Chase cookies and it can't use your Amazon cookies. But if the same origin policy didn't exist, this is, this is how easy it would be, right? All right, I've said the word origin and domain now. So, uh, a little bit of a, a quiz if anyone wants to take a guess uh, or knows. Cookies are scoped to a domain, but origins actually mean something different. And same origin policy is, focuses on origins and not domains. So let's assume that JavaScript is loaded from HTTPS colon slash slash www.example.com slash home slash homepage.html. In the browser's eyes, and there's a there's a strict definition here, so it's not just like a an opinion. But what in, in to the browser, which of these, if any, or it could be multiple, are considered to be the same origin as this URL here? Anyone want to take a take a guess? I'm gonna guess. I think they all, all are. The world minus D. Okay, I heard all of them, and then did you say all of them minus D? Yeah, that, those are my two. My guesses. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I, think, I think I would be inclined to agree with the either all of them besides B, and I'm going to say E because the 8443 looks like a port, maybe. Okay. So, yep. Looks okay. like we're getting some B and E only. B and E only. Okay. So the answer is actually only B. Um, and it's because origins have a strict definition that has to match on three parts and all three parts all the time. And those three parts are the scheme, the host, and the port. So the scheme in this example is HTTPS. So right off the bat, we can eliminate C because C is not HTTPS, it's HTTP. So it can be everything can be the same, but one's encrypted, one's not. Doesn't matter, different origins. The host is the full domain, full F, like fully qualified domain name, including the subdomain. So we look here at the host and that is www.example.com. So right off the bat, then we're eliminating A because A does not have www, it's just the bare domain. And a lot of you got this, right? We can eliminate D because D is on api.example.com. It's a different domain. And then the last one, someone also recognized the port is important. 8443 is, not, is a different port than the default HTTPS, so it's a different domain. So you can see that this is, they, they look like they might all be related to the same app and the same example.com, but origins are pretty strict. It has to match all three of those, and B is the only answer that's actually the same origin. So how is JavaScript like I've, I've now used the term and my diagram has been like, okay, JavaScript that's loaded from an origin can only talk to that origin. But what does that even mean to say like, how is JavaScript loaded from an origin? So there's, there's a couple different ways that you can get the browser to execute and load JavaScript. Basically though, it has to be included somewhere in the HTML that gets returned from the server. So the most common way, and this is I'm sure how you're probably like starting your React apps as you write them, is you have to have a script tag. And the script tag, loads JavaScript and executes it. 
So when a browser encounters a script tag with a source attribute, it will make a request to fetch whatever JavaScript is defined here and then execute it. But you can also execute JavaScript in line with uh, things like on click. Uh, and then in, in the quotes here is JavaScript that's also executed. The thing to know is all of these that you're seeing here, like these hello messages, are considered to be running on the exact same origin. And it, it doesn't matter that this hello.javascript file, I don't know if you can see my mouse, apologies. So you probably don't know what I'm looking at. But the the uh, the second script source that's loading a hello.js from attacker.ropnop.dev is, yes, the JavaScript file is on a different origin. But because it's included and downloaded in this origin, it's considered to be part of this origin. So it doesn't matter where JavaScript comes from. What matters is where, where it starts the execution. OK, uh, so that was a lot. But th those are basically like the, the main concepts of web security and web models, same origin policy, JavaScript, like domains and cookies. Um, so understanding all of that is like an awesome, like the, the, the foundation, that's what we need to start talking about vulnerabilities. And we're now gonna start talking about some security concerns that can be broken up into two categories. Uh, we have client-side vulnerabilities and server-side vulnerabilities. And they are different because they target different things. Uh, and they're kind of can be thought of as like backend versus frontend, Django versus React. Like we have vulns and issues that can affect the backend and we have vulns and issues that can affect the frontend. Uh, I mentioned the OWASP top 10. Uh, so this is you know, a, a awesome curated list. It is not an exhaustive list. Do not, con do not think that there's there's only 10 vulnerabilities in the world. Uh, this is just like the top 10. Um, and it's a really good way to just like kind of understand what the current state is. And this, as of 2017, because um, the 2021, 2021 version just dropped and I didn't update the slides yet, but it, it looks a little similar, uh, is the OWASP top 10. Number one, injection. Number two, broken authentication. Number three, sensitive data exposure. Number four, XXE. Number five, broken access control. Number six, security misconfiguration. Seven, cross-site scripting. Insecure deserialization, components of known vulnerabilities, and insufficient logging and monitoring. We're going to be talking today and uh, this afternoon, walking through examples of injection and cross-site scripting, as well as cross-site request forgery, which technically is no longer in the top 10. Uh, but it was for years and uh, it's still pretty prevalent. So I'm gonna talk about it. And broadly speaking, we can kind of break these up into two categories, uh, like breaking them down again, right? There's certain things that are technical vulnerabilities and there's certain things that are like design vulnerabilities. I mean, insufficient logging and monitoring is really like not a technical vulnerability. It's just like a vulnerability in how you've designed or architected your application. Um, and the spotting, they're, they're all equally important, but you know, when we're doing pen testing, we're usually looking at the technical vulnerabilities. All right. Uh, so that was our web basic vulnerability. Um, that section took me longer than I thought. No, uh, but there was awesome questions and like really good discussions that went through there. So uh, I'd like to, Maybe just take another break, uh, just so I can get a little bit more coffee. Uh, but maybe we'll just do like a quick, like, five, how about seven minute break? And we'll come back at 1110. And then I would really like to try to fly through kind of talking about testing and some of the vulnerabilities so that after lunch, we can really get the hands on portion done. Does that sound good? Yep. Awesome. Then I will see you all in like seven, six minutes now. Uh, and, and we'll keep going and try to get back on, on schedule here. Uh, okay, cool. Recording started. So like I said, apologies. I'm like looking at the time. I realize I'm like a little behind where I uh, normally am with these slides, but I have been loving it. Uh, and hopefully you have too. I just think we've had really good questions and conversations. So I will try to go like a little bit. Um, uh, I, won't, I won't like speed through. We'll just see what we can get through. 
how about that? But please don't don't let that discourage you from asking questions because I'd much rather have discussions and conversations and answer questions than just read you my slides. Uh, and oh, I'll share all these slides with you too. So if there's something that we run through too quickly or don't get to, you'll have it all. Okay, uh, so we're gonna talk now about how we actually do testing. Like how do we look for vulnerabilities based on all of the stuff we now kind of understand the JavaScript interactions with the DOM and the same origin policy. And at the end of the day, like modern web apps can seem ridiculously crazy complicated, like React apps, if you're looking at them, like made up of millions of lines of code of JavaScript and doing insane stuff, like crazy hard to follow and all this stuff is like animated and reactive. But at its core, every web application we look at is just a client talking to a server over HTTP. That's what a web app is. So testing and looking at web apps is always just a matter of reading, sending, and modifying HTTP. <laughs> Simplified diagram here, browser or client, server, uh, and HTTP request. Hey, give me the homepage. Okay, there it is. Oh, perfect. The homepage says I need a JavaScript file. Give me the JavaScript file. Okay, there it is. All right, nice. Now I want to load this meme. Give me the JPEG. Okay, yep, there it is. Like it's all just a bunch of, I mean, there's tons of them, but there's just, all it is is just request response, request response. So we need to, when we wanna test stuff, we wanna look at that HTTP and we potentially wanna modify that HTTP. So how can we do that? Uh, if you're a super elite hacker and you want, you could just write HTTP raw by hand. Like you can just open a, a raw network connection and start typing out HTTP and sending it. Um, that's, that's not gonna get you very far though. That's the, not really the best way to do it. The better way is to use a proxy. And a proxy, uh, an intercepting proxy like Burp Suite or Zap, visually kind of fits in like this. It's a man in the middle. It sits between the client and the server and inspects everything going through it. So uh, in a normal you know, session, we're talking directly to the server. This time we're talking to the server, but we have a proxy in the middle. Uh, the, uh, in, uh, uh, the cool thing about using burp or zap or proxies is um, the client and the server don't really care or are not even aware that there's a proxy there. Like our client might think it's talking directly to the server because it doesn't know any better. And the server thinks it's talking right back to the client because it doesn't know any better. But every single request response pair is, is hitting this proxy that lets us view it. The majority of web app attacks, I, I, I would venture to say, are essentially just sending unexpected HTTP requests to a server and the server not knowing how to handle them in a secure fashion. Uh, so this is my, my super overly simplified web security in a nutshell diagram. Um, web apps are written uh, in a way that you are expecting certain things to come your way. You're writing your Django app and you're expecting like certain requests and, and, and formats of data that you're receiving. And you write your code and you write your application to handle that data. But if you get unexpected data, garbage data, random data, bad data, does your, if your application isn't configured securely to handle that, unexpected behavior can happen. And that's essentially what we use a proxy for. We use a client like a browser to trigger good requests. Then we, before that good, so the browser sends out a good request. Before the good request reaches the server, we mess with it somehow. We do something bad to it. And now we've sent this modified bad request to the server. And if the server gives us a, a WTF response, that's a, a super technical term uh, that I made up. Uh, and the WTF response is where vulnerabilities live. So these WTF responses are what we want. And these are what security testers live for. Now, this goes back uh, all the way to the earlier question, right, about HTTPS. Like, what about SSL or TLS? Um, the whole point, or um, one of the main points, right, of HTTPS is that you should not be able to look at the traffic. Well, we want to look at the traffic. So shouldn't all of that, like, shouldn't HTTPS just solve all of this? 
And the answer is yes. You cannot put a proxy in front or uh, right in between HTTPS traffic and expect to see anything. All you would see is gibberish. Uh, you, however, when we're doing testing, we are testing and tampering our own traffic and using our own browser. So what we do as testers is actually explicitly disable some built-in security protections so that we can see that encrypt the traffic. And we're doing this to ourselves, and we're doing it in a controlled fashion because we know what we're doing. But yeah, we basically have to disable some security protections of the browser in order to view our HTTPS traffic. Uh, essentially what we're doing, and we're all gonna walk through this together after lunch, is we configure our uh, intercepting proxy to accept encrypted traffic. And then we configure our browser and we basically weaken our browser security to trust our proxy's security uh, certificate for HTTPS. Visually, what it looks like then is, is we still have encrypted connections. The traffic between the browser and the proxy is fully encrypted. And the traffic between the proxy and the server is also fully encrypted. But the proxy decrypts the traffic and then re-encrypts it. So we have this like kind of break in the flow of traffic where everything is decrypted so we can see it and then re-encrypted before it gets sent out. And when it's decrypted, that's how we can actually modify and tamper and look at what's happening. Uh, I'll pause because I know there was a question earlier, like a high level, does this kind of make sense? Like how HTTPS can be temporarily disabled and then re-enabled so that we can actually look at things? Hey, Ronnie. Yes. So as a tester, you're putting a lot of faith in Burp Suite. And I know that it's kind of like a trusted tool to do a lot of this. And we're trusting that it's not going to scrape any of our data. Um, but is there like a guarantee or anything that you do on your side to kind of protect from that? Because I'm sure that all the data that you are collecting is not something that you want to get out. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and it's a good, it's a good valuable lesson to call out, right? Is don't just trust and run arbitrary security tools on the internet. You know, if you if you see someone on Twitter that's like, oh my God, like I just wrote like this new le like hacker script, uh, go ahead and just run it. Like, don't don't just go ahead and run it. You're like, you don't know what it's actually gonna do. So we do put a lot of faith into Burp Suite or Zap or proxies that we want to use. Uh, and we put faith and trust in them to not misuse or, or mishandle our data. In much the same way that we put a ton of faith into Firefox or Chrome to actually be secure browsers. Um, so yeah, if you find like a new sweet hacker uh, forum in Russia that's only accessible over Tor and they're talking about some new intercepting proxy that you can download and install on your machine, yeah, don't do that. Uh, Burp Suite is, is a well-recognized like industry tool. They sell Burp Suite. So they, their entire reputation as a company is based on this. Uh, we're gonna use the free version, but like their business model is selling it. And Zap is completely open source. You can actually look at the source code and it's maintained by you know, OWASP who ensures that no bad code gets in there. All right, so those WTF responses uh, lead into Ronnie's golden rule of web security. If you take away one thing from this entire workshop, Remember this as you are writing your web applications in you know, React, Django, whatever, or combination of both. Never ever under any circumstance, not even for a second, ever even consider trusting user input. What I mean by that is we have to code and we have to engineer our applications to handle the unexpected. If you ever make an assumption that the data you are getting is trusted, you are going to be vulnerable because it's too easy to modify and send bad stuff to your server. And this is really like, the, I mean, the crux and, and core issue of, yeah, sounds like Michael Scott. Yeah, this is basically the core issue of like most web vulnerabilities is the server, the application was written in a way not thinking of bad data coming your way. Um, so never, ever, ever just, just make the bad assumption, right? You know what happens when you assume uh, don't ever assume that all the data your application is going to receive is good. You have to always assume that it's evil and, and then take appropriate actions based on that. All 
Okay. Um, so that is brief overview of like why bad requests and WTF responses and in happy path versus bad path are like important in testing. Um, what I'm going to do now is try to before lunch actually dive into three different vulnerabilities and explain like what they do, why they work, and then a little bit on how to defend them. And then after lunch, we'll actually uh, open up and install Burp Suite and, and, and see these in action. Ronnie, I have a quick question yes. about the previous slide. Um, so for the regarding like the this golden one? rule. Yep. Yep. Um, regarding like the golden rule, uh, would implementing safeguards like making sure that the user input is like a specific variable type or in a specific format sort of come under that? Or is the golden rule like just like even more general? Uh, both. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is general, but so the general thing is like never expect the variable that you're receiving to be what you think it should be. Um, that's like kind of the general application, right? Specifically, what you said at the beginning is spot on. Like you need to ver you have to verify. Uh, you know, it's trust and verify. Uh, you, you or don't trust verify, I guess is, is the better way to put it there. Um, so let me go back to my what the you know WTF response here. A, a here's a classic or good example, right? Let's say you write a web application. It's a form, and you're asking people to put their address in, and you have a field to ask for the zip code. Uh, if you write your application and exp and accept anything for the zip code, you're opening yourself up to potential risks and vulnerabilities. Like we know what a zip code should look like, right? Like it should be five digits or, or nine digits with a dash. Like we know what it should be. So we want to write our application to verify that any zip code that we're receiving looks like a valid zip code before we try to process it. That's how you kind of apply the golden rule. Don't just assume like, oh, I get I get a, a zip code here. I'm going to go ahead and store it in the database and, and process it. Because if I'm an attacker and I see that you're accepting a zip code, yeah, I'll send like, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Like that looks like a valid zip code. Um, I might also just send you like 30 gigabytes of cat memes in the zip code field. <laughs> All right. And, and see how your server responds to that. And your server, uh, your application should be configured to be like, wait a minute, this is like 30 gigabytes of cat memes. I don't even know how this person got that many cat memes, but this is not a zip code. I'm just going to reject the response. A, a vulnerable or a bad server would be like, yep, you sent me a zip code. I'm not even going to look at it. Like, it's, I'm going to save it and try to, to try to save it in my database. Does that kind of make sense? It does, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, and 30 gigabytes of cat memes is just a, uh, a, a silly example because that probably wouldn't do much. It might like crash the server, but we're actually going to you know, talk more about like what a payload or a, a bad zip code could do to actually cause more, more things. Um, nice. Someone's got the hookup for me. So if you want to send me 30 gigs of cat memes, um, don't. <laughs> All right. So cross-site scripting. Uh, who's heard of cross-site scripting? Uh, I, I think have, I have. I have did a, even did a lab on it, and I still don't actually understand what it is. Okay. It's not something to do with JavaScript. <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, hopefully, this will clear it up for you. Cross-site scripting is, yeah, to be honest, like a really confusing concept. Um, and this is this is actually one thing that I use all the time in like technical interviews for security engineers because I like to see how well they understand cross-site scripting because it's a beast. All right, so cross-site scripting uh, occurs when an attacker is able to force a victim's browser to execute JavaScript within a trusted origin. That's the, the basis or the base definition of cross-site scripting. It's all about executing JavaScript that you didn't intend to execute. It's also a terrible name. Cross-site scripting as a name like means nothing. Like no one, like that kind of is a confusing name, I, I believe. Um, so don't focus too much on the name. Like, don't necessarily think about cross-site. It's all about loading and executing JavaScript within the same site or the origin. <coughs> In the context of the same origin policy, that like super important castle wall, our main defense and fortress, 
Cross-site scripting allows an attacker to completely bypass the same origin policy because it gets them, it allows them to get their JavaScript to run in the same origin as the site they want to accomplish. And this is accomplished through content injection. So content injection is actually a much better name for cross-site scripting. Like if I could go back in time, not that I made the name cross-site scripting, I don't, I think Microsoft did back in the 90s, they named it, it should be named content injection or JavaScript injection even. Um, instead of cross-site scripting. So we know that in the same origin policy, uh, JavaScript that's loaded in the attacker's origin down here cannot ever access anything in chase.com's origin. So in these examples, I'm gonna be attacking my bank, like chase.com, these are not real attacks, don't worry, Chase actually has very solid security. Um, but this is this is same origin policy defense working right but in a cross-site scripting attack malicious javascript is quote unquote smuggled inside legitimate http responses so that we can get it to execute inside the origin so if you visit attacker.com and i give you bad javascript no harm done because that javascript only runs inside this like protected sandbox here and can't access anything However, if my, if my bad JavaScript comes from chase.com, then same origin policy is off the table. So this is what a cross-site scripting attack looks like at a very high visual level. As an attacker, I'm actually sending bad JavaScript to chase.com. And chase.com is misconfigured to, to basically replay or smuggle that JavaScript in a normal HTML response. Now my JavaScript has, even though it started being loaded from over here, since it came in a response from chase.com, it's now being executed inside this boundary, this uh, blue box here. And this malicious JavaScript is now inside the origin and within the castle walls, like a, like a Trojan horse getting through the gate, right? We've Trojan horsed in, bad JavaScript into this castle of, of the origin of chase.com. And our bad JavaScript now has complete access to everything within that origin on that user's browser. So how can we do that? I mean, that, that, sounds, that sounds hard, right? Like how could we get chase.com to send malicious JavaScript to a user? Um, there's three different techniques for accomplishing this. And I'm calling it content injection because it's really about injecting some bad content into chase.com. The first is called reflected cross-site scripting in which an attacker is able to load JavaScript from a trusted origin by reflecting it up to and back from the server, usually through sending some sort of crafted link to a victim. So again, high level visually here, I'm an attacker and I want to target Tom. And I say like, hey, Tom, like check out this awesome cat meme that I just found. And it's a link. And, you, and the link is www.chase.com slash XSS. Like replace the red XSS with actually bad JavaScript. And Tom clicks that link. And the link takes him to chase.com with this bad JavaScript. And chase.com is misconfigured to reflect or replay stuff that goes up to it. Um, and if chase.com is vulnerable to this, what's going to happen is Tom's going to get all the valid chase.com stuff, like the HTML, the CSS, the, the good JavaScript, but also in that response is going to be the bad JavaScript that I sent him in the initial link. And now to the browser, this bad JavaScript came from chase.com. And the browser doesn't know that it's bad JavaScript. The browser thinks, oh, this is JavaScript that came from chase.com. It's trusted, I'm gonna go ahead and execute it. So we were able to get malicious JavaScript running inside Tom's browser, and the browser thinks that it was legitimate JavaScript that came from chase.com. This is a reflected attack. Um, and and like, if you think this is a bit of a contrived example, it's really not because there's actually lots of times that web applications do reflect content back to you. Right, it could be like a, a API endpoint called like greeting or something, right? And you send your name and the server, like I send, hey, my name's Tom. And the server responds like, hello, Tom. 
like the, the string Tom is actually being reflected because I'm sending it to the server and the server's sending the same thing back to me. If Tom is replaced with, with bad JavaScript, that can lead to reflected cross-site scripting. The other technique is called stored cross-site scripting or persistent cross-site scripting. Uh, it's slightly different because instead of just like a, a one-time like echo back to me, um, we're actually able to persist or store the bad JavaScript on the server itself. Uh, so this could look like um, in a, a classic uh, example, like you're maybe not for chase.com, but let's say it's like a blog that has comments and you can write a comment on the blog post. Like when you submit your comment on the blog post, that comment is persisted, right? It's saved on the database. Like in your Django application, you save the comment. And then anyone who visits the blog, your comment is loaded because they can read, you know, they can read my comment. Um, anyone who visits that page can see the comment from Ronnie. If that comment is bad JavaScript, then the attacker can actually get the server to save a malicious bad payload. And then anyone who then visits that blog post, the server fetches the bad payload and returns it to the server. The end result is the same thing. The browser looks and says, I got a good response from chase.com. This Everything that I get from chase.com is trusted. And oh, there's some JavaScript here that they're asking me to execute. That JavaScript must also be trusted. I'm going to go ahead and execute it within that origin. Uh, yes, virtual hand. So that's when uh, they say, like when we, you go to do text interpolation, um, let's say in, in Django, and you're going to send back that comment and it, they they'll say on the documentation like don't do it like this because of this and this is what they're talking about where this javascript comes in and you get gets ran and what they tell you to do instead is to supply it as a parameter to that to a function call and then i think they're doing something with it to uh, encode it and then garble it so it's, it doesn't work right 100 percent. yep exactly that's why like it <laughs> We can't say like don't ever return data to the user. Like that would just make the application uh, unusable, right? Like we want comments on our blog. Like that's how our application works. But comments on a blog post should only be text. It should be like read only. It should not be like dynamic JavaScript code that gets executed. So yeah, Django and all the frameworks warn you against doing that and have functions that will ensure that whatever gets sent back to the user is just text. Like it's just read only. It's not actually like code that should be executed. Yeah, exactly. Cool. And the last technique uh, is a lot harder to understand, um, but it's also unfortunately a lot more prevalent and common in today's world. Uh, and that's called DOM-based cross-site scripting. And in DOM-based cross-site scripting, the attacker is able to load JavaScript from a trusted origin by passing it essentially as a variable, passing it into dynamic JavaScript that's already loaded and executed. Um, because most modern web apps are like entirely JavaScript, like that's why this is more common now than just like traditional like HTML forms going up and coming back. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to explain it the best I can here. Visually, it, it kind of looks like this. The first time I go to chase.com, let's say chase.com is like a React app. JavaScript or chase.com will send me all the React JavaScript. And now I am running the, the chase.com React app in my browser. And that JavaScript is trusted and that JavaScript is executing. Like React is dynamic. It doesn't just execute once and stop. It's constantly executing, right? Now I'm sending like a, a malicious link with cross-site scripting payload embedded in it. And the cross-site scripting payload is actually a variable that gets passed to the React app itself. So it doesn't get passed up to the server. It gets injected directly into React. Because the React app is already loaded and trusted from Chase, the variable that gets injected into the React app, if it is executed by mistake, is also considered trusted code. So it's uh, in DOM-based cross-site scripting, it's essentially like injecting bad JavaScript into already running JavaScript. This one, this one's like a, a little bit confusing, but does that does that kind of make sense? Um, the main the main difference between DOM-based cross-site scripting and like reflected or stored cross-site scripting, which you can see visually, 
is our bad payload here never actually touches the chase.com server. It, it, it exists entirely only within the React app or the JavaScript app that's already running. Can that include like a JavaScript that would simulate like keystrokes and stuff so that you could, uh, I think, I think I've seen or I've heard of like a rubber ducky will simulate keystrokes. And so it's hard to defend against it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So potentially, yes. Um, you know, there's lots of like reactive JavaScript apps that like literally as you type the, cha the, the, pa the, the page changes dynamically based on what you're typing. Um, and actually, like that'll be one of our examples after lunch when we will find a DOM based cross site script, then I'll show it to you in action. So it might make a little more sense. But, you know, a good example would be like uh, a, a, a app that as you type, it's dynamically filtering, like type ahead, you know, or something like that. Like I'm searching for something and at every keystroke, like I'm getting different responses uh, appear on the screen. If I can, uh, what's happening then is like every time I hit like the letter A, the React app is interpreting A as a variable and executing a function. If instead of the letter A, I pass a bunch of bad JavaScript and the React app is misconfigured to execute some function that doesn't properly handle you know, malicious code, then we can trick React into executing bad JavaScript for us. Is that, is that uh, kind of the, the, the question? Yeah, yeah, that works. Cool. All right, so when we're looking for cross-site scriptings, like when pen testers or, or security researchers are trying to find cross-site scripting, they'll oftentimes just pop up an alert box. And like, like the, the classic cross-site scripting payload is, is just these like six letters or, or however many letters of, of JavaScript, alert one. Um, when you call that in JavaScript, it pop, the browser pops open a alert box with the content of one. In reality, this doesn't do anything. This isn't like doing anything malicious. It's just a visual and easy representation of JavaScript code. If you can pop an alert box that says one with alert one, you could replace alert one with a hundred lines of malicious JavaScript to steal your, your you know, password or steal your, your credit card number. Um, you know, we don't, we don't really do anything malicious when we're testing for this. If we get alert one to fire, we know that we can get anything else to fire. So we can kind of stop there. Um, and that's why uh, if you see like alert one pop up, it's really bad. It's bad in theory. It doesn't mean alert one is causing you like harm or damage. It just means that you prove that you can execute whatever you want. And alert one is just like a visual easy way to prove that. So on that note, like what could you do? I mean, alert one doesn't do anything. It just pops up an alert box, but what can you do? Um, really the sky's the limit. It's like up to your creativity. Uh, same origin policy no longer applies. So that fortress of, of castle walls that protects us on the web is down. Um, JavaScript can control anything in the origin. So we can write JavaScript to do whatever we want. We could write malicious JavaScript to read sensitive data like cookies, passwords, session tokens, uh, you know, credit card numbers. JavaScript can also completely control the DOM and what's visual. So you could just completely take over the page and rewrite it and have it say whatever you want. Um, or you can also do background silent requests, like things that the, uh, suddenly is happening that the user is completely unaware of. Um, in, in practice, like real black hats, when they find cross-site scripting, you won't know that you're actually being a victim of cross-site scripting. They won't pop up something like alert or make something super visually obvious. Uh, you'll look like you're just using the site normally, but in the background, all this bad JavaScript is running, collecting your data, collecting your keystrokes, um, stealing things from you, doing actions you didn't mean to. Uh, it, it can be pretty bad. Uh, really, the, the best way to think of it is like if cross-site scripting is executed, you are infected. Like you've got uh, you've got a virus or something, right? You cannot trust anything on Chase.com anymore. Chase.com is infected, and anything you do on Chase.com is compromised.
<laughs> yeah, the computer COVID, exactly. Uh, so takeaways for this, cross-site scripting is really, it should just be called content injection. It's all about injecting bad content into the origin. And since that content comes from a trusted origin, it's already inside the origin. So same origin policy does not apply. And JavaScript is fully powerful. It can do it whatever really we want it to. So key takeaway is cross-site scripting is bad. Cross-site scripting is essentially full read and write access within an origin. Uh, yes, virtual hand. So would this uh, would the vulnerability be limited to things associated with with that origin? So like if I have a vulnerability on the Chase website, obviously like everything related to Chase and my computer thinking it's talking to Chase's, but it it, it wouldn't you know. Uh, create vulnerabilities for what my browser might know about Bank of America or, or that type of stuff. Is that correct? Exactly. Yes. Thankfully, the same origin policy is still there and it will protect us um, in much the same way that like attacker.com's JavaScript can't access Chase's data. Uh, even if Chase is fully compromised, Chase cannot access Bank of America's data. So you're, when, when I say you're infected, it's not like your entire browser is infected the origin is infected. Anything for chase.com is not trusted and infected, but anything for amazon.com, bankofamerica.com is still safe, thankfully. Thank you. Yep. All right, so with that understanding, we'll kind of talk a little bit about how to like mitigate it. And um, someone already, already, we already talked a little bit about how Django gives you functions. Um, but cross-site scripting is about injecting content, which the browser interprets as JavaScript and tries to execute it. So the main way to do that is to never insert untrusted data into the DOM directly. And untrusted data is anything that comes from a user. Any incoming request, never just take that blindly and then re return it directly into the DOM without inspecting it and making sure it's good. And we can do that through a couple ways, validation, sanitization, or output encoding. So validation is like my zip code example. Um, if you got a zip code that was like valid JavaScript, something's wrong. Like you know what a zip code should look like. So you validate it. And if it doesn't match what a zip code should look like, you just kill it. Uh, and you do not process it any further. That's input validation. Sanitization. Um, and, and validation works on fields like zip codes when you know you have very expected values. But for like a comment on a blog post in which you want to just like let someone write anything, uh, that becomes more difficult, uh, pretty like very basically impossible, right? Because um, someone could want to write valid JavaScript, like say they're replying to a Stack Overflow question and they actually want to write JavaScript in there. Like that's a valid response. You actually do want to like show JavaScript, but you don't want it treated as JavaScript. So that's where sanitization comes in, sanitization or encoding. It's, we don't trust this input, but we do need a way to display it, but we wanna display it safely. So in sanitization, uh, you're essentially removing any sort of special characters, which the browser would interpret as, oh, I'm gonna execute this. And in uh, encoding, and output encoding is actually just a form of sanitization. Um, we're gonna escape or encode all the special characters in HTML so that when they're rendered and displayed, they're literally just text, static text and not dynamic code. Um, the, the example of like, you know, a Stack Overflow question would be like, you, we want someone to be able to write the word, write the phrase uh, script alert one, you know, with the special characters. And we want that rendered and displayed as text, but we do not ever want that actually interpreted as if it's valid HTML or valid JavaScript. So we can do that by encoding and sanitizing it, which is telling the browser, this is literally just text. Don't try to do anything with it, just display it. It's like read only, just static text. So you can do that server side or client side. Um, on server side, Django has a function called escape, which does exactly that. Any, any code, text, anything you pass to the escape function will be returned to you as just text and that's safe to use. Uh, and it'll do things by like converting special characters and things like that with HTML encoding. And then that is safe to put into the DOM. 
if you want to do it client side, um, if you're writing like pure JavaScript instead of something like React, you should definitely avoid the JavaScript functions inner HTML. Uh, inner HTML, there's a typo there, but inner HTML is used for injecting dynamic code. Don't use that. Use inner text. Inner text is for injecting static text. There's also a client side JavaScript framework called DOM Purify, which is essentially like uh, escape, like Django's escape, but you can run it in JavaScript to client side instead of server side. And client side frameworks like React, fortunately, do this out of the box by default. So if you're using React with like data binding variables um, in your React components, thankfully, you're already protected. Uh, this little React function here to return a component. Uh, by data binding this variable my data under the hood react is calling like their equivalent of dom purify or escape for you uh, and so my data here will always only be static text and not actually interpreted as code okay i i I flew through the cross-site scripting slides, um, but like I said at the beginning, cross-site scripting is like a, a beast. Um, my intention was to try to just like conceptually explain like why cross-site scripting is bad and what it does in the context of same origin policy and JavaScript execution. But uh, I really want to pause here to make sure like it's it's clear or clear enough for you all. So um, is this making sense? And uh, any questions or things I could go back and try to explain a little bit more cross-site scripting conceptually before we see it in action after lunch? Um, is just so I'm clear when we're talking about alert one, mm -hmm. um, is that like an understand, is that like a shared understanding within the security world? Like alert one is like a, a hello world. Like when programmers talk and they say hello world, that means something to them. Like alert one is a similar thing in the security then is what you were saying. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great analogy. It's just like, if you get a hello world application to run and it says hello world, I mean, it doesn't do anything meaningful, right? But you've basically proven that you've written valid code. Uh, and that's exactly what alert one does. It, it shows you that you've executed valid JavaScript, but it doesn't do anything more than like a hello world. In fact, we could just say like alert hello world, it'd be the same thing. Um, but in the security context, seeing an alert pop up with something that we controlled is means, extrapolate that out, it means we could run whatever we want. Just like how Hello World could be extrapolated out to like a, a super advanced program, uh, all we've done is prove that we can execute something and it actually runs. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Then um, we can always go back if you have other questions or come up, um, but I'll talk about the other two vulnerabilities and then we will break for lunch. So the next vulnerability I'm going to talk about is called cross-site request forgery, also known as CSERF. Um, has anyone heard of this one before? It's a little less pervasive than cross-site scripting. Yeah, any framework will make you add that to forms um, to protect to make sure that it actually came from your site. Yep. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because that's actually like I feel like how most people are exposed to CSERF. They don't know what it is, but when they're using a framework, there's all these like functions for like CSERF tokens and CSERF cookies and things like that, um, which are baked in there to prevent the vulnerability CSERF. So CSERF is also another quote unquote bypass of the same origin policy. So according to the same origin policy, right, resources loaded from one origin should never be able to write data to another origin. Same origin policy prevents anything on attacker origin from writing or interacting with anything on Chase's origin. But, and I, I meant, I, I said this earlier because someone asked the question, right? There's actually two notable exceptions to same origin policy. And those are HTML requests and cookies. And CSERF abuses these both. Um, and I mean, I, I suppose historically the reason is because HTML and cookies predate the same origin policy. 
So they're essentially kind of like grandfathered in and, and they don't always apply. There's some gray area here, which can be abused. Hey, hey Ryan, just a quick, quick uh, clarification on my part. Mm -hmm. uh, is HTML requests different than HTTP requests? Uh, yes. Yeah, thanks for um, checking me on that. So HTML request is not really a technical term. Like if you Google that, like it, uh, that, that's not a standard term. Um, it's something that that I use to describe uh, going back to like a previous slide. Uh, it, it's essentially a way in which you can tell the browser to make an HTTP request through HTML. The, the other way uh, to do it is you can tell the browser to make an HTTP request through JavaScript. And you do that through like the fetch command, the fetch function or the XML uh, XHR function. Uh, when you tell the browser to do an HTTP request over JavaScript, same origin policy 100% applies. If you tell the browser to do a HTTP request through an HTML entity, same origin policy does not apply. Okay, so like when we do form method equals post, like that's HTML? 100%, yep, exactly. When you do form, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's classic uh, C surf attack through form post um, or like loading a, a resource or even just typing a URL into your um, browser's bar and hitting enter is an, is uh, kind of, it's not, that's not JavaScript. It's not a JavaScript request. Okay, so yeah, visually, um, we, same origin policy applies to JavaScript, but if a HTTP request is triggered by HTML and not, and like JavaScript is not involved at all, same origin policy does not necessarily apply. So technically, this is allowed. And where the risk comes from with HTTP uh, requests or HTML requests going over HTTP is you know I talked about how the browsers are extremely quote unquote helpful and just send cookies automatically and that causes all sorts of headaches for us in terms of privacy and security. Um, this is exactly why CSERP is bad, is the browser automatically includes cookies without your explicit permission. And we'll see why, why this is bad. So CSERF attacks require a few, they're kind of like a special scenario. Um, at a, at a, a high level, they require a few things to be in place. And so not every application out of the box is, is vulnerable to CSERF. There's plenty of applications in which CSERF is never a concern. But if these, three, if these three things exist, it is a concern. One is a state changing request, essentially a, a write request or an action request. Um, if your application is read-only, you don't have to worry about CSERF. It's only if your application is like taking uh, taking action, like chain, like updating a username or updating a password or writing something that can be vulnerable to CSERF. You also have to be using cookie-based authentication. Uh, if you're not using cookies and there's plenty of apps that just don't have cookies at all, then you're not vulnerable to CSERF. And it also requires user interaction. So there is a component of we must trick a user into clicking a link or visiting a bad site for CSERF to even exist. OK, so CSERF, again, is a, a, another good interview question for me because there's components that, that have to kind of follow in order here. This is high level visually what a CSERF attack looks like. Um, first, I want to target an action on chase.com. Let's say that, uh, right, it's not, it, it can't be like a read action. Um, I want to, to, to abuse a, a, a write action or, you know, a, a user who takes action. So in our example, let's say chase.com lets me send money, right, transfer money to a different account. That's the action I'm going to try to exploit with CSERF. And what I'd like to do is exploit and trick Tom into sending me money. So I'm gonna to try to trick Tom's browser into using chase.com's transfer uh, request to send money my way. And do that through two things. First, 
I own a, a web server that hosts some sort of bad malicious payload, and this is attacker.com. And then I know where Tom lives, or doesn't know where he lives, but I know how to get, get a hold of him. So maybe I'll send him a link and say, hey, click this link. And the link is to my attacker server, and it's a page called CSERF. So Tom talks first to my server, and this CSERF payload comes back. Now, in the cross-site scripting example, when I say the cross-site scripting payload is usually JavaScript. In CSERF, the CSERF payload is HTML. The malicious HTML comes back from attacker.com, and, and Tom's browser interprets and reads the HTML. That HTML is written in such a way that Tom's browser will interpret it and immediately either redirect or send a post request to chase.com. Tom is already logged in to chase.com. He already has a valid session and his browser has a cookie. It remembers that his session is valid in the browser. Because browsers are so overly helpful, the browser says like, oh, you're, you wanna redirect me to chase.com? All good, I already have a cookie for chase.com so Tom doesn't even need to log in again. So I'll go ahead and redirect and I'll send Tom's session cookie to chase.com. But that, that redirect is a post request to like slash account transfer with some data to transfer money to Ronnie's account. And because that, that post request to transfer data includes the user's cookies, chase.com has no reason to believe that, that Tom did not actually want to send this request. The server has no way to write it. The, the, the server has no way to determine whether or not uh, he meant to do that, right? We can't interpret user actions. All we can do is just look at the request that comes our way and decide whether or not we want to execute it. So chase.com server is like, well, all I see is that Tom just sent me a post request to transfer money to Ronnie and he sent me a valid cookie. This all looks legitimate. There's no reason that I should deny it. So I'll go ahead and allow it. And now Tom has just initiated a transfer uh, to give money to Ronnie, even though he never actually went to chase.com, he went to attacker.com. His browser did some redirect stuff and sent this request. Something I've always been curious about is what stops me as an attacker from going to chase.com? I open up you know, the Explorer and I go, oh, hey, cool. Here's a Caesar token. Uh, and I'm just going to put that in my HTML response that redirects and does all this. Why wouldn't that token work for Chase? Because, you know, if I go put up a form from Chase and leave it open for an hour, it still works. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great, great question. And sorry, what's your name? I'm James. What was that? James. James, sorry. Um, yeah, so great question. And the, the reason that it doesn't work or should not work is because that CSERF token that chase.com uses only works for you. It will not work for Tom. It will not work for me. So you can always do it to yourself, but the point of a CSERF attack is to do it to somebody else. So if you copied your CSERF token or your cookie and gave it to Tom and had Tom execute something, it wouldn't work because chase.com would recognize like wait a minute this token and cookie is for james and this is tom i'm not gonna i'm not gonna follow through with it but it's an excellent way to think because if your server is not configured that way like if every single user gets the exact same cserve token you don't actually have any cserve protections at all they have to be unique per user so that you can only use it for yourself and you can't use it for tom does that make sense yeah so Okay, thanks. <laughs> and Ronnie, yep. I had a question too. Uh, for attacker.com, would the idea be too, would this matter where when they redirect the user, would they redirect the user to something similar to Chase to make them think like they did do a transfer or anything? Or would that, you know what I mean? Like, would that be a situation where they would think they did and they wouldn't, or would that make it different? Um, yeah, yeah, another really good question. So uh, we, we cannot redirect them to some sort of lookalike because we actually need the real chase.com to interpret that request. So it's, it's slightly different than like, you know, redirect them to a phishing site that looks like chase. Uh, we actually need to talk to the real chase because we need the actual like transfer to go through. And that only happens on the real chase.com. 
But, but as we'll see when we demo this after lunch, um, sea surf attacks, if you fall victim to a sea surf attack, are pretty easy to identify. Whereas cross-site scripting, things can happen in the background. Um, in this scenario, like let's imagine, you know, this is this is Tom, right? And he clicks the link for my cat meme. If he clicks the link for my cat meme, uh, all of a sudden he'll see like his browser like load a few pages, and then he'll end up on the page that says transfer to Ronnie successful. And we we can't control that. Like that has to happen as an as an attacker. But usually by that point, the damage is already done, right? The money has been transferred. But it's pretty easy to spot as a victim because you'll be like wait, what the hell just happened? Like I clicked a link for cat memes and now I have a transfer confirmation for $100 to Ronnie. Like that's what it looks like as the victim and you're like something weird just happened. Thanks, appreciate it. Yep. Oh, sorry. Uh, would cap just work to prevent that? Like for confirmation for a bank transfer? Um. Yeah, CAPTCHAs or like an additional level of like verification uh, is certainly a good way to notify the user, right? Like, I mean, again, this is all a very like contrived example. Like Chase won't let you just send money to an account with like no confirmation, right? Um, so in reality, even if I tried to do this, I think what would probably happen is like Chase would instead, you know, prompt you to re-enter your password or say like, are you sure you want to do this? Or perhaps put a CAPTCHA in front of it. Um, so, you know, chase.com has very solid security, but replace chase.com with some other like janky web app, uh, that doesn't have that in place. And this becomes a lot more common and nefarious. Uh, in fact, like you, you, you ever noticed how anytime you want to like update your password on a, a web app, they make you re-enter your current password. Um, that is primarily to prevent this type of stuff. Like a sensitive action, like changing a password shouldn't take place without some sort of manual verification step. So whether the verification step is re-entering your password or we're gonna send you an email and you have to click the link to verify it, like all of those are controls that the web apps have put into place to prevent just like unauthorized actions from happening automatically. Cool, great, great questions. Uh, I love the, I feel like these questions are coming from a place where like you're, you're understanding the concepts really well. So this is awesome. All right, what does that malicious HTML look like? Um, CSERF uh, payloads are actually relatively simple. Um, all they are generally is just a really simple HTML page with a form. And the form includes a post action to some sort of like account transfer mechanism with the data we want to send. So in my previous example, like if I wanted to like trick someone to transfer me $1,000, and this is obviously very simplified, uh, my bad HTML payload is this. Uh, it's just HTML and there's a form that posts to chase.com slash account slash transfer with two values, like I want to send it to Robnop and I want to send $1,000. And then there's a little bit of JavaScript here that will automatically submit that form when the page loads. And that's all it takes for a successful CSERF deck. I mean, all it takes, a lot has to go right. The, the server has to be really vulnerable and misconfigured to allow this. But if it does allow it, like this, this would work. So uh, like I mentioned how cookies are sent automatically, um, here, if, if I were to load this HTML and this post request triggers automatically, and I looked at what the HTTP was, I sent an H, and I didn't do this manually, right? My browser automatically did this for me. I sent a post request, if you look up here at the top first line, post to account slash transfer. And then the bottom red box is those variables that I specified to Ropnop amount equals a thousand. Then everything in this big red box are cookies that were automatically sent to my behalf. That's the browser trying to be helpful, but actually hurting us in this case, because in, in somewhere in here, like, yeah, a lot of these are silly tracking cookies, but somewhere in here uh, is my actual like authentication cookie. 
Um, I noticed in the refer that it's just referring from localhost mm -hmm. and not a specific port from localhost. Why is that? Um, so the refer header, uh, great, great question. Um, will always include like what site you were on when you sent this request, right? So in this example, because I, I set this up to get the screenshot, I had that bad HTML just being served um, from my local machine over to HTTPS. So the refer is telling Chase, right? Chase, and I actually did send this to Chase's servers. Like, thankfully, they rejected it. This doesn't actually work, right? But Chase's servers would have seen that um, someone was on a, a local host uh, on this CSERF example page, and that is what was that's where they were right before they sent this to me. Um, and and I guess to your question about why I didn't include the port. Um, if you don't include, the, there's an implicit port number uh, based on the scheme. If you have HTTP colon slash slash and then a host name with no port, it's default 80. It's interpreted as default port 80 and HTTPS is default port 443. So you could include the port, but you don't have to. The only time you really have to include the port number is if it's not one of those standard ports. Got it. Okay, so it's just like implicitly assuming that it's from either of your the port four four three, I guess, since it's an HTTPS. Yep. Yeah. So this was four four three on my local host, but we it the browser won't include that because it's def, that's the default port for HTTPS. That makes sense. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Ronnie. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Duncan. You you said you 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 actually sent it. At what point does it be, or at what point is it illegal? <laughs> uh, yes. Mean, good question. Is this a knock um, on the door, or would it be considered like breaking and entering? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because that's an important point to clarify. I know I like gave the big scary warning at the beginning about not wanting to commit crimes here. Um, yeah. Two two reasons uh, that I guess I felt comfortable doing this. Um, one is Chase has a bug bounty, so they actually like explicitly invite and allow this type of probing and looking. Because if this had worked. And I had actually found a CSERF vulnerability on Chase, I would have reported it to them and they probably would have paid me pretty handsomely for it. Um, secondly, there definitely is a little bit of like gray area, like you said, a knock on the door. If I'm sending something that I know won't work, um, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm not deliberately trying to attack or do anything malicious. I'm just basically sending junk to Chase and their servers, you know, I didn't include the response, but the response here was just like a error message from Chase being like, yeah, this is a bad request. I don't know what you're trying to do. And I knew that it would do that. And so it, it really wasn't doing anything like probing or malicious. It just didn't work. Okay, thanks. Yep. Ronnie, I have a question. Sure. Good. What's something that you could do to chase that would be illegal? Can you give us an example of that? I'd have to look at the terms of their like bug bounty program. So most mature organizations that have like a bug bounty program like lay out terms of engagement, um, but that are usually pretty clear on like what's in scope, what's not in scope, and like when you should stop. Uh, there, there definitely is gray area. And if I'm being honest, I think a lot of bug, not a lot, there's a, a contingent of bug bounty hunters that I would say are not really white hats. Um, and they might be more gray hat. There's another term like mixing. They're not fully like criminals, but they're also operating in this like gray area of, of taking things too far. So I think an example would be, let's say, I'll use Chase as the example. Um, let's say chase.com has a bug bounty program that that welcomes vulnerabilities, but they ask you to just report them after you discover them. And I find like a really bad remote code execution vulnerability. And I actually get a, get a shell or get inside Chase's internal network. If I'm a pure white hat and I was following the rules of engagement, I would stop there and report it. If I, I was a gray hat, I might keep poking around. Now I'm inside Chase's network and, oh, look, I see like, you know, Tom from finance's laptop on this network. All right, I'm gonna hack into his laptop and now I'm gonna look at his documents and then I'll read his documents and I'll find some sensitive information.
information in there, like non-public, you know, financial information. And then I'll sell some stocks based on the information that I got. Like that, that definitely has now crossed the line into like above and beyond white hat ethical hacking. Um, that's when it would be illegal. Or in the C-Surf example, let's say this did work. Like I'm Ropnop, so I would do this to myself. Or, or maybe I have two Chase, Chase accounts that I use the test with, but they're both me and I just transfer money back and forth. That's ethical and within the scopes of their bug bounty program. If I was like, oh, I'm gonna prove this out and uh, you know, I'm quote unquote gonna prove it out by sending it to a hundred strangers on the internet and having them all transfer me money. I mean, that's illegal. Now I've just I've literally stolen money. <laughs> Ronnie? Yeah, yeah, James, um, that's a good uh, analogy. Like knocking on the door and it falls down. It's like, yeah, wait, this wasn't supposed to happen. It, it, it is, I mean, I, I'll try not to get on my soapbox too much, but like this is really like the gray area of like ethical hacking and wanting permission because uh, if I'm like a locksmith, I'm not going to like go around trying to pick people's front doors. And then as soon as I do be like, oh, your lock is weak. Here's my business card. Like I'll fix it for you. Like that's not really ethical, right? Like that's still a crime, even though if I'm saying like, well, I'm just doing it to show them that they're vulnerable. Like unless they've asked me to pick their lo the lock on their front door, I can't do that. It's the same thing with like poking around and finding these vulns. Sorry, and I interrupted someone who was starting to ask a question. Yeah, I was just curious, um, when we go into the developer tools on a browser to see the post request going back and forth or the HTTP request, is that look, looking at the network uh, tab in there? Is that where you can see these requests go back and forth? Yep, you can definitely use that. This screenshot's actually from Burp Suite. So you can also, you can do it all within the browser of the developer tools, um, or when we configure Burp Suite, then we can see it in Burp Suite uh, as a, the intercepting proxy. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Uh, the reason we use like Burp Suite um, in, in this particular case is in the developer tools, like the network tab is read only. It'll show you like what has been sent and what was returned, but it won't let you like change it or modify it in any way. Whereas Burp Suite will. Uh, okay, so CSERF prevention, I'll go through kind of quickly because the silver line in all of this is CSERF is dying. Um, CSERF is not as bad and prevalent as it once was, um, primarily because the world is moving towards JavaScript and JavaScript doesn't really fall victim to CSERF as much as like old school HTML heavy apps. But there's a few ways to prevent CSERF. Um, and it really all comes down to uh, not trust, not not trusting requests based solely on the cookie. Like cookies cannot be trusted uh, by themselves. So we have to add basically like another sort of verification method. Someone mentioned captchas exactly. Like we have to do something else to verify that the action is what we want to be taken. And a traditional way is through what's called synchronizer tokens or CSERF tokens, which is a a random value that's tied to a specific user that's necessary to also be included with the cookie. So we make a decision based on cookie plus token, not just cookie. Um, a better, easier method, and this is why CSERF is dying, is if you use JavaScript, then same origin policy applies and same origin policy prevents this. Um, so a couple of like couple approaches here, uh, and I'll share I'll share the slides uh, so you can reference this because this is kind of a little dense. Um, but basically, you can use things like synchronizer tokens, double submit cookies, custom headers, or the third approach if you're doing like you know a pure React app and you're talking to just a Django API, um, you may be able to just get away without using cookies at all. Uh, and if you don't have cookies at all, then CSERF goes away. Um, here's an example of a, a simple example of like what this extra value on top of the cookie could be. And it's usually like a, a value called the CSERF token or XSERF token. Um, and basically what we do is we write our application in a way that anytime a sensitive action is going to be taken, such as transferring money, we require both a cookie and this extra value token. And the reason that this works um, is because 
cookies will always be sent automatically, but a custom value like a CSERF token will not be. It has to be explicitly added when you make the request. So as an attacker, I cannot trick Tom into sending the special CSERF token value. I can trick him into sending his cookie. That's how CSERF works. But if there's one, something else besides a cookie I can't control, then when you get both of them, you can make sure that Tom actually sent it and he wasn't tricked. So this is a, another screenshot of like a post request here for a CSERF that is actually secure. And the reason it's secure is because it, we have a session ID cookie, but we also have this CSERF token value. And all the server needs to do is make sure that both of these values are valid before it accepts it. And if one of them is not, or one of them is missing, it rejects it. And uh, note down here, you know, most client-side frameworks can do this automatically. Like Angular, for example, sends an XSERF token um, usually automatically, or it can be configured to just send it. So you, you don't even really have to think about doing this. Most modern frameworks like have this protection built in. The other uh, approach, I, I won't read all the code, I'll just show you the screenshot, is you can also just send a custom header. In HTTP, you can specify like any additional headers. They can be anything, they can be arbitrary. So if you have a custom header, and this is a pretty common one called XSSERF token, um, as long as the value is there, then uh, you can also be assured, basically, right, we have a cookie and we have a custom header, and we trust that. If the custom header is not there, we do not trust it. All right, so in summary, CSERF is all about really abusing this like legacy stuff of the web, uh, like things that existed before same origin policy and before JavaScript. And it's like HTML and cookie behavior that automatically happens without the user's interaction. Um, as a, uh, when it relates to like same origin policy, uh, I mean, really, it doesn't relate. It just doesn't even invoke the same origin policy. But you can think of it like CSERF allows you to write data cross origin, like take actions cross origin. Um, but you cannot read data cross origin. Like CSERF is like write only. You're blind to what the action does. You don't get to see the response. And it can be easily be prevented by either using JavaScript so that the same origin policy kicks in or using things like custom headers or additional verification. Okay, hope I didn't lose you there. CSERF is actually kind of like more complex in theory, I think, than cross-site scripting was. Um, but uh, any, and we'll, uh, you know, again, we'll see, we'll see about, uh, examples of, of what this looks like to a victim after lunch. But any questions on CSERF before I move into the last category, and then we'll take a break for lunch. Okay, cool. Um, we're gonna try to fly through then uh, this last session uh, and to hopefully take us to like 12.30 and then we'll, we'll break for lunch. So injection. Uh, injection is and has been, I think since the beginning of the OWASP top 10, the number one vulnerability. Now we've talked about cross-site scripting and CSERF, which are kind of like targeting users and their browsers and tricking them into certain things. Uh, injection, on the other hand, is a server-side vulnerability. We're not necessarily targeting Tom specifically, we're targeting Chase uh, when we find an injection vulnerability. Chase, chase the bank, not chase the person. Um, and it really is all about the golden rule. It, it, it happens when the server handles unexpected or untrusted input um, without validating it or encoding it. And it can take many forms. Uh, at the beginning, someone asked about SQL injection. That's what we're going to talk about. But SQL injection is just one form of injection. Technically, you can also have command injection. You can have template injection. You can have XML injection. Um, any type of, of code that gets injected and interpreted server side is an injection attack. So injection usually occurs when a server has to take input and translate it. And I put translate in quotes because uh, usually what, what occurs, right, is web servers talk HTTP. They expect HTTP, 
but there's other backend technologies at play, most commonly like SQL, like you have a database that stores your information. So when you do like a lookup, like I send my username to a server, I send that over HTTP and my username is Ropnop. The server takes HTTP, but now it has to talk to a database and a database doesn't talk HTTP. So the server has to translate in a way HTTP to SQL. Then it talks SQL to the database it gets the response and then it translates the SQL response back into HTTP and sends that back to my browser. So this is doing like a, a database lookup for a username. What's happening is the server is, ac is accepting the username of Ropnop. Then it translates it by constructing a SQL statement, select star from users where username equals Ropnop. And that HTTP parameter is put into SQL, right? Then the SQL database replies and the server does some other sort of translation oops, to send my response back to the browser and HTTP. Like you don't send raw SQL data back to Firefox. It wouldn't know what to do with it. So you translate it again and send it back uh, in, over HTTP. This is where the golden rule comes from. If you're doing that translation, that can be very dangerous if you're just blindly trusting anything that the user is sending you and then translating it to like valid SQL. Because as an attacker, I could send, I could say that my username is this, ropnop single quote or one equals one semicolon dash dash. If the server is misconfigured and vulnerable and just blindly trusting that and constructing a SQL statement directly from this variable, What's going to happen is you'll end up with a SQL statement like this. Select star from users where username equals Ropnop. And then this second single quote after Ropnop is actually was passed in via my HTTP. So it becomes close quote or one equals one semicolon dash dash. Uh, does anyone know what this statement would do uh, in, in SQL? It, uh, it's, is the username or true? which should be true. So just to return everything. Exactly, yep. So uh, yes, uh, w initially, right, the server only wanted to retrieve one user, only one user that matched the name Ropnop. But by injecting some valid SQL into the statement, now this is basically, yeah, one equals one is always true. So if we have an or true, it's always, everything is true. So Ropnop doesn't even have to exist. And what's gonna happen is the server, the SQL server, is just gonna return every single user. And then if the server is again, right, misconfigured and is blindly trusting, it's then gonna take this massive table of every single user, convert it to HTTP and send it back to me. So that's SQL injection in a nutshell. It basically lets you escape from a normal SQL query and inject additional SQL parameters. And uh, sometimes you need to be really creative. And this is where like having good knowledge or in-depth knowledge of like SQL, uh, well, there's flavors of SQL, right? MySQL, Postgres, et cetera. And then knowing like how to construct co complex queries uh, really helps an attacker. But thankfully there's also some really awesome open source projects that can take care of a lot of this for you. So the classic like OR1 equals one is a good example. In practice, that doesn't exist much like for more hardened servers. But you can do crazy things like if you look, if you read the payloads here, you can start constructing like automated payloads that are like, you know, select 7857 from select count, can cat hex values, select rand from it. Like you can do all these crazy SQL queries to bypass like filters. So to mitigate SQL injection, um, just follow the golden rule. Just never ever trust user input. Like don't just take a random HTTP request, construct a SQL statement from it blindly and go ahead and send it to your database. Uh, so a couple popular methods that, that exist to mitigate SQL injection is to escape everything, use stored procedures or use an ORM. Escaping everything really means like there's, there's certain special characters that mean things to SQL. Quotes, single quote marks, for example. So if you get a username that has a single quote mark in it, you should escape that or not trust it. Um, and you could enforce that by saying like, all my usernames have to just be only alphanumeric characters, no special characters. Like side note, if you ever see, you know, um, 
like form or a old application and not just old. If you ever see an application that's like, enter your password. And then it says like, oh, this special character is not allowed in your password. It's probably because they're trying to do something like this. It's in my opinion, not the best way to do it, but it does work. Like if you want to say like, oh, your password cannot contain quote marks. It's that's one way to protect against SQL injection. Uh, the other way is um, through stored procedures, which are functions with an SQL I won't um, really talk about. But the better way, and if you're using Django, you're probably doing this already, is through like ORMs, which are application wrappers that can safely construct SQL queries for you without you having to write raw SQL, which leads me to like my other golden rule. Um, if you're writing a web application that talks to a database and you're like writing raw SQL statements by hand, strongly reconsider what you're doing. Like it, you probably shouldn't be doing that because that's just like a landmine waiting to be stepped on. Um, use like a framework that's going to construct those in a safe manner for you. And uh, so, yeah, like one way would be uh, in Django, right? You can do like user.objects.filter name equals username. Like that is safe. If you're writing something in Python where it's like I'm starting with a string and here's like my SQL statement and then I'm going to put this string interpolation in here and then I'm going to execute it, this is not safe. That is uh, SQL injection waiting to happen. This is safe because Django handles this stuff securely for you. Uh, all right. So we'll, we'll pause there. Um, any, uh, and, and I forget who it was at the beginning who asked about SQL injection, um, but if, uh, is there any, any questions or comments before I guess we, we break for lunch on SQL injection or anything more I can go into here? All right, then. Um, yeah, main takeaway from SQL injection, like this is what it looks like. It's when untrusted user is, untrusted user input is translated or constructed to a different format and then executed and you're not, you're not taking appropriate security cautions or measures there. Um, so we will, uh, I'll break for lunch now. And when we come back, I'll, uh, I'll walk everyone through like actually setting up Burp suite, and then we'll look at a vulnerable web app that I've written that has all of these vulnerabilities. And I'll walk through um, uh, finding them and exploiting them. Uh, and hopefully, it'll kind of like click into your mind, like, oh, that's what this looks like when it's exploited. Because um, we've talked about everything kind of conceptually now, then we'll get hands on. So, uh, how long do you normally all take for lunch? Uh, our, our, our students don't eat lunch. They just power through. So we just keep going. No, okay. uh, we should take right, well, well, your your guest instructor eats lunch. So I'm going to have to. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, we used to take an hour. So maybe come back at 1.30 if that works for you, Ronnie. Um, yep, that should work. And then we wrap up at 4. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we have flexibility. Again, we don't want to take up too much of your time. But yeah, we can go beyond 4 as needed. Um, our class usually lasts till like 5 or 5.30. So we do have them till like 5-ish. But again, okay. we don't want to take up all, the, all, the, all of your time either, but um, well, that's fine. I just want to make sure we, oh, we have kind of enough time for like the CTF at the end. So Absolutely, that, uh, yeah, that's yep. definitely something uh, I just didn't enjoy. So yeah, yeah if, so if 1.30 works for everyone, should we? Let's do, let's do 1.30. Um, if you all want to get like a head start, uh, if you're on like a slow internet,